<clears throat> okay, Rich, I think we can start. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the May 18th, 2021 public hearing, public meeting of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. I will call the roll. Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Leffy? Here. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Here. Okay, we're all set. Great, thank you. And welcome to the May 18th public hearing and meeting. We will begin today with a hearing on a proposed item for designation, and that will be followed by public meetings for two items, two other items that are proposed for designation, which have already had a hearing and for which will and which we'll be voting on today. These three items were calendared in January when we launched our equity framework, and they represent the multifaceted history of our city. So I'm so glad that we're looking at all three of them again together today. After the votes, we will have a public hearing and public meeting for applications for work on designated properties. And we will start with the public meeting agenda to review revised proposals for applications that have already had public hearings and for which the commissioners have already heard testimony and given comments. And that will be followed by the public hearing agenda for new applications. This hearing and meeting are being held via Zoom and live streamed on YouTube. <clears throat> And if you'd like to watch the proceedings, please visit our YouTube channel to watch the live stream. If you would like to testify on any of the hearing items, please join the meeting at the estimated time for that item as shown on our hearing agenda, which can be found on our website. And finally, before we get started, I have to make a very bittersweet announcement. Rich Stein, our external affairs coordinator, will be leaving LPC at the end of May after two years with us. And today is his last public hearing. Um, Rich has been a vital part in helping LPC to get its virtual hearings up and running, ensuring that advocates and community members could actively participate during our hearings, quickly answering any questions they had. And I think, you know, we all see him looking very cool and calm and collected as he reads the testimony summaries. But behind the scenes, he's working on many other things, talking to members of the public, texting, emailing them to make sure that they know how to work in Zoom and are able to participate, um, collaborating with other team members behind the scene just to make sure that these days run so smoothly. Um, he's also kept us organized, distributing testimony to commissioners and responding to inquiries from the public. He's been um, crucial in maintaining and building relationships with community boards and neighborhood associations, often really serving as their first line of communication. And those relationships are so important to our processes. So that's incredibly uh, valuable to us. And he's also been a great part of our outreach team and has helped make sure that even virtually LPC has been able to continue to do outreach to communities throughout the city. So, you know, we're going to really miss Rich's enthusiasm, his dedication. He, you know, is always up for any task and um, is a real team member and has just been a great addition to us. And it's going to be a, a real loss for us, but it's going to, so all those skills are going to serve him so well in his next role and in his future. So we wish you the best of luck at the same time, Rich. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate those incredibly kind words. And, and to you, uh, to LPC staff, uh, to the commissioners, thank you so much every week for making our hearings as successful as they are. Um, and to the advocacy groups and to the members of the public who put so much meaning into what we do every week, thank you as well. Um, it's been an incredible opportunity uh, to work alongside you all uh, in serving this incredible agency. Uh, so it's been a real, real pleasure. So thank you. Thank you for everything, Rich. Okay, so on that note, we'll begin our research agendas and I'll turn it over to our Director of Research, Kate Lemus McHale. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> 
Uh, the item number one on the research department public hearing agenda is LP 2648 Conference House Park archaeological site at 298 Satterley Street, aka 298 to 300 Satterley Street, Staten Island, block 7857, lot one in part. Item uh, proposed for a public hearing today is the proposed designation of an approximately 20 acre site within Conference House Park that is associated with over 8,000 years of occupation by Native American people and contains important archeological resources. The proposed landmark Conference House Park archeological site is located in Tottenville at the southernmost point in Staten Island. The site is associated with over 8,000 years of occupation by Native American people. It contains the region's largest known ceremonial site and is the best preserved known archeological site associated with Native American occupation in New York City. It is proposed as the city's first landmark specifically recognizing the many generations of Native Americans who lived in the area. Designation would protect the site's below ground archeological resources. Shown here in red, the proposed landmark site includes approximately 20 acres of highly archeologically sensitive land located within the city's Conference House Park. There are two designated New York City landmarks located directly north of the proposed landmark site, Conference House, which gives the park its name, and the Henry Hogg Biddle House. Native Americans have lived in what is now New York City, including Conference House Park, for thousands of years as indicated in this timeline. One of the earliest sites discovered on the East Coast was in Staten Island, about three miles to the north of the proposed landmark site. There, artifacts were found dating to about 13,000 years ago. In this earliest period, the geography and ecology of the area were very different from today. People only stayed in places for brief periods of time as they focused on hunting big game like mastodon. Over the next millennia, the area evolved to become a place with abundant and varied resources, including nut bearing trees, fish, and shellfish like oysters and smaller game like deer and turkeys. The Lenape began to stay in places for longer and in the woodland period beginning about 1500 years ago, villages were built as local resources were utilized to support more people for longer lengths of time. Archaeology can and has shed light on what life was like for the people who lived in this area over this long period of time. The proposed landmark site was visited and utilized for thousands of years. Today it overlooks the confluence of Arthur Kill and the mouth of the Raritan River, an important estuary that significantly shaped the area's ecosystem. Native Americans certainly relied upon the abundant resources that surrounded the site including ample oysters, fish, and game. In the woodland period, a village was likely at this site as well as a ceremonial site. The people who lived here were Lenape and spoke Munsi. We're not certain of the name of this village or how many generations of people lived here, but at least in the 17th century, the village may have been called Aquahanga Manaknong, which was also used as a name for Staten Island. It has been translated as high banked island in some historical sources, but we're consulting with the Delaware tribe of Indians who have asked their Muncie speakers about both the name and the interpretation so that we may learn more. The Dutch map shown here from 1639 shows the locations of many Native American villages at that time. None are shown in Staten Island, but we think that's likely a reflection of the ignorance of the map maker. Archaeology has provided information about the proposed landmark site's long occupation. Over 19 archaeological projects have occurred in the vicinity of the proposed landmark site since the 19th century, including work by the American Museum of Natural History in the late 19th century. These projects uncovered an important ceremonial site that was used over a long period of time. In addition, over 100 archaeological features primarily associated with the woodland era village were uncovered. Archaeologists also uncovered a series of hearths and other artifacts from the early archaic period about 8,000 years ago, confirming that cooking, butchering, and tool making were among the activities that occurred at the site at that time. The site still contains archaeological resources, including the shell midden shown here on the right. 
Shell middens are collections of discarded shells, usually oyster, that sometimes include other types of food waste, tools, and on occasion, culturally sensitive materials, and provide further indication of the long use of the site by Native Americans. For context, a close-up view of an exposed shell midden, not located at Conference House Park, um, is shown on the left. A series of wars erupted in the 1640s and 50s as Europeans colonized land on Staten Island. In 1670, the British drafted a land deed that involved several Native American signatories who were Lenape and spoke Muncie. While Europeans viewed contracts such as this as a purchase agreement, scholars have noted that at this time, the Muncie did not perceive them the same way, understanding them more as temporary tenancies. We don't know when the last Native Americans left the area, but there is little archeological evidence of a Native American presence in the vicinity of the landmark site after the mid 1670s, indicating that by that time, the expanding British settlement had largely forced out Native American population. In 1676, Christopher Billop received a land patent from the Crown for more than a thousand acres. It included the proposed landmark site as well as the land to the north on which he built Conference House, named for an unsuccessful peace conference held there during the Revolutionary War. Henry Hogg Biddle House, built circa 1853 by a wealthy real estate developer, is located just north of Conference House. Photos of these two designated landmarks are shown on the left. After Samuel Ward purchased nearly 400 acres of land in the area, it became known as Ward's Point. And although it was surveyed and laid out in the 1870s, it remained largely undeveloped, as is evident in the 1907 Robinson map shown here on the right. A few streets in the area were paved prior to the 1920s, and the curbs, street lamps, and trees that lined these streets remain visible in some places within the landmark site. The proposed landmark site contains significant historic era archeological resources, including evidence from the period of contact between Native Americans and European colonists, as well as from the colonial period and 19th century. For example, projectile points made of copper and brass have been found at the site. These metals became available once Europeans began to trade with Native Americans. And so finding evidence of such points is considered a key indicator that the site was used in the contact period. This image is a depiction, a Dutch depiction of their encounter with Native Americans drawn in 1651. In 1926, Conference House Park was donated to the city of New York and today it remains under the ownership of the Department of Parks and Recreation. The modern park includes paths like the one shown here on the right, hiking and biking trails and a visitor center. Woodlands and beach comprise the remainder of the site. The photo on the left was taken recently when members of the tribal nations joined a few of us to visit the proposed landmark site. The proposed landmark site, as I said, would be New York City's first to formally and specifically acknowledge and recognize the thousands of years of Native American occupation and settlement in the area. As a New York City park, the site has long been protected and cared for by the city's Department of Parks and Recreation. And after designation, LPC would review all projects within the proposed landmark site with the potential to impact archeological resources. Uh, commissioners, as was discussed when the site was calendared, there are site specific resiliency issues related to rising sea levels at this coastal shoreline site. And we will continue to work with parks and with the federally recognized tribes to create an appropriate protocol to address what to do if significant resources are impacted by storms and other related issues. This map shows the proposed landmark site very closely corresponds to the boundaries of the National Historic Landmark outlined here in green, which was established in 1993 as the Wards Point Archaeological Site to preserve its archaeological resources. The area is also listed in the National Register of Historic Places as the Wards Point Con Conservation Area, which encompasses the proposed landmark site. LPC research of the site is ongoing and includes engagement with the city's federally recognized tribes, including the Delaware Tribe of Indians, the Delaware Nation, and the Stockbridge Muncie Community Band of Mohicans. As we mentioned at Calaring, 
calendaring, we're seeking input from the tribes um, on many things, but including the, the official landmark name, which we hope uh, to change to better reflect its Native American significance. Designation of the Conference House Park archeological site would protect and preserve the largest and best documented known site associated with thousands of years of Native American habitation in New York City. Um, and I have been presenting this for our larger team, which encompasses both the research and archeology span department. So that includes Amanda Sutphin, Director of Archeology, span Mary Nell Nolan Wheatley from the research department and Jessica Stribal McLean from archeology. span And they're also here for any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Commissioners, do we have any questions before we move to the public testimony? Okay. All right, I think we don't have any questions. Um, many of us have been on a site visit with um, the team and met the parks department there as well. And uh, our resident commissioner sort of helped lead that tour as well. And so it was a, a great outing for us all to see the site. And um, we're looking forward to hearing the public testimony today. So with that, I will turn it over to Lisa Kersavich, our, our executive director to walk us through the public testimony. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And um, we did have people sign up for this item, but I'd ask any, everybody that would like to speak to please raise your hand um, so that we know that you are available. And ready. And great. I'm going to start with Sybil Young from New York City Parks. And Sybil, I've brought you in. Great. Um, good morning, Commissioners. I'm Sybil Young, New York City Parks' Historic Preservation Officer. Um, I'm going to be reading a letter in support of this designation from New York City Parks' um, Commissioner Mitchell Silver. Uh, Dear Chair Carroll and members of the Commission, I am writing on behalf of New York City Parks to support the proposed designation of the Conference House Park archaeological site as an individual landmark. While the park, while the park already includes the individually landmark Conference House, this designation, which will recognize the site's thousands of years of Native American habitation, will call attention to this additional very significant layer of the park's history. As we are aware of the high level of archeological sensitivity, we have been voluntarily working with LPC on archeological coordination when our projects involve below grade disturbance. We remain committed to preserving and protecting this archeological resource and look forward to formalizing our consultation process with this designation. We support this proposed designation and we encourage the commission to vote in favor of designation for this important historic and archeological resource. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next we have um, Susan Batcher. And Susan, I brought you in. Hi, how are you? Good, good, and we can hear you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, commissioners, for, for listening to me. Um, my name is Susan Bacher, and I'm an archeologist and a historic preservation specialist for the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Um, our office, our East Coast office is, is located out here at East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania. We have been working closely with um, New York City parks with uh, the SHPO, with many organizations throughout the city and state. Um, and we wholeheartedly support the idea of nominating and um, changing the designation or raising the designation for this location um, to a, a landmark, a city landmark. It will help with protections um, for the site, um, increased protections, I should say, for the site and also will um, allow a continued dialogue between the city and the federally recognized governments of the tribes that, that still reside here and claim that as their homeland. So we would look forward to our continued um, partnership in building this park and building it into a 
a historic site not only for the state but for our country and also for the tribes themselves to come back and visit on you know on a annual basis or however um, so again i fully support the nomination and i hope you will vote in favor thank you hey, thank you very much okay next we have meredith glenn Okay, Meredith, do you just need to unmute yourself? Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Meredith Lynn. I'm Assistant Professor of Historical Archaeology at Bard Graduate Center. And I'm also current president of PANIC, Professional Archaeologists of New York City. Today, I'm here to provide testimony on behalf of that ar organization of archaeologists who work in the New York City region. So on behalf of PANIC, I commend LPC's uh, proposal to designate Conference House Park in Staten Island, a landmarked archeological site. Um, this would be an important step to recognize Native Americans and the history of our region, as well as our city's rich archeological resources, which are invaluable sources of information for understanding our city's past. Uh, we at PANIC strongly support the protection of this extremely significant and largely undisturbed site used by Native Americans since the early archaic period. Um, and as Kate Lemos McHale just explained so well, previous ar archeological projects indicate the, sites, uh, the site contains the largest known pre-contact American, Native American ceremonial site in New York City, a woodland period village, as well as features and artifacts dating to early- okay, look at, That's Santa, but under the sea version. <laughs> um, so, so um, uh, <laughs> uh, I was saying that um, uh, the, the site contains many important sites within it, um, including uh, the largest known pre-contact Native American cer ceremonial site in New York City, a woodland period village, as well as features and artifacts dating to the earlier archaic period, uh, as well as the later contact period. So um, the site contains spaces and items sacred to Native American people. Um, as we just heard also from uh, Susan Backer. Um, and we thus applaud and strongly support your proposal to provide critical local city protections to the site that's already recognized on the National Register. Um, we also urge you to consider expanding the spatial boundaries of the city landmark designation beyond the national landmark boundaries that are currently proposed because they wouldn't protect all of the known significant Native American resources at the conference house site. Um, so thank you for your consideration, and we strongly encourage you to vote in favor of this designation to protect Native American history and cultural resources at Conference House Park. Great, thank you very much. Okay, next we have um, Kelly Carroll. And Kelly, I've brought you in. There we go. There we go. Okay, there's always a lag on my end. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. The Historic Districts Council enthusiastically supports the proposed designation of the Conference House archeological site as an individual landmark. While extant structures associated with the colonial and white occupation of the site have long enjoyed the protections of landmark status, preserving the land that is the park and the treasures that lie beneath this hallowed ground is overdue. In addition to the gesture of recognition and acknowledgement of the presence and role of Native American populations in New York City, this designation will also trigger LPC review of all projects at the park and bestow a new regulatory binding authority of the agency over these resources. It is the first designation in New York City landmarks history to specifically recognize generations of Na Native American people. Unfortunately, many sites of pre-contact have been lost or developed in the United States. This strategic lo location nestled between the Arthur Kill Tidal Strait and the Raritan Bay at the southernmost point of New York State is a veritable palimpsest of 8,000 years, over 300 generations of Native American history. There are still human remains in the aptly named Burial Ridge section of the site. 
We look forward to the Landmarks Preservation Commission's forthcoming designation report as an important update and contribution to the scholarship of the site, which has not been formally documented in a public facing paper since the National Register nomination of the Wards Point Conservation Area in 1984. A fresh new contextualization of the documentation and analysis regarding the archaeological site is necessary to reflect the societal and cultural shift toward inclusivity, hidden histories, intangible histories, cultural landscapes, and the stories of all marginalized peoples, and in this case, the victims of genocide. This, gen this designation is the second archaeological landmark designation in the city, the other being the African Burial Ground and the Commons Historic District in Lower Manhattan. It would be remiss to not acknowledge the presence of another important cultural site, the African Burial Ground in Elmhurst, Queens. The small plot of land at 4711 90th Street has survived for over three centuries as a touchstone to one of the earliest freed African American communities in the region. Founded one year after emancipation in 1828, newly freed African Americans swiftly established a congregation, the United African Society, on the site of the burial ground. The descendant congregation is still active in this plot of land where their roots began and which still contains over 300 never disturbed burials persists barely touched in an ever-changing city. We urge the commission to schedule a vote for Conference House Park as soon as possible, and for commissioners to please consider the African burial ground in Elmhurst as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that, does that seem to be it, Lisa? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, but great. Sarah. Oh. Oh yeah, and can can we just bring Kelly back for a minute? I just want to uh, note quickly that um, these are another. Sarah, so I'm uh, sorry, I I just brought Kelly back. I'm, I apologize. Great, for that. thanks, Kelly. I wanted to just also acknowledge um, your announcement, which is uh, that Kelly will be leaving HDC after seven years, and. She's going to be moving fully into education. So in addition to working at HDC and um, coming and seeing us every week, she's been teaching at NYU, and now she will begin teaching historic preservation at the Mather Building Arts and Craftsmanship High School in the fall. And this is an amazing program, and it's so important for the health of our field to engage young people. And so I know she'll do a great job at it. And congratulations, Kelly. Thank you for all of your advocacy here and your collaboration. And we wish you the best of luck in your new position. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate the kind words. Um, I have been testifying for seven years with all of you. And before that at Landmark West, I won't name commissioners around the table that I knew that were there in 2012. But um, it's, been a, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. And I really thank the LPC staff and commissioners for your dedication and service, you know, as preservationists, we, we really care about these things and we're all overworked and um, it's a labor of love. So I really appreciate all your partnership over the years and the hard work that you all do. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. So Rich, did we receive any additional written testimony on this item? Yes, we received several letters uh, from organizations in support of designation. Okay, great. Thanks. And there's somebody... Sarah, I, th I think Christabel Goff has her hand raised. It went up and down, okay. but let's, let's bring her in. Okay, Christabel, I, I brought you in. Um, Thank you. I mean, you want to... Okay, great. This, this is Christabel Goff speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Speaking of the importance of a very different open space, a field at Gettysburg, he had come to dedicate to the dead. Abram Lincoln said, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The commission is in some ways in a comparable position at Conference House Park. However, it is possible for us to acknowledge and remember the history involved and offer the possibility of governmental protection 
of the place as a monument. So we strongly support designation of this archaeological site. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, just to make sure, there, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Okay, I think we're, I think we're good. I want to thank everyone who spoke today. It's uh, very moving and this is a, uh, an important um, proposal for us and for the city. And so we look forward to bringing this back for a vote in June and we'll let everybody know when we're ready to uh, schedule that public meeting. Thank Sarah, you was all. Rich, was, Sarah, was Rich gonna, did he have something to add before we brought Christabel in? He already he was, did, Mark. He did, okay, all right. Yes, we're all good. Okay, so I think it, commissioners, if there are no last minute questions, we can move to close the hearing. So I'm gonna start to unmute you all. Okay, and Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we will come back in June uh, for the final public meeting and schedule the vote at that time. Thank you. And we'll now move to our public meeting agenda. Okay. Item number one on our public meeting <clears throat> agenda this morning is LP 2649, the Holy Root Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz at 715 West 179th Street AKA 715 to 721 West 120 79th Street and 426 to 434 Fort Washington Avenue, Borough of Manhattan, Block 2176, Lot 30. Item proposed for designation is a Gothic Revival style church designed by Bannister and Shell and built in 1911 to 16 that has played an important role in the Latino community of Washington Heights. Holyrood Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, is architecturally significant as a sophisticated and well-executed Gothic Revival design by the architectural firm of Bannister and Shell, and historically and culturally significant as an important social and religious anchor for the Washington Heights Latino community for the past 40 years. When built in 1911 to 1916, the church's construction reflected the stability and resources of the Washington Heights neighborhood as it transitioned into a thriving residential area. It has remained an important institution within the neighborhood, its congregation changing to reflect the influx of residents from the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and other Spanish speaking places starting in the 1960s. By 2012, in recognition of its role in its in this community, the church changed its historic name to add its Spanish translation, becoming Holyrood Church Iglesia Santa Cruz. And recently it has expanded its outreach by also becoming a center for the hearing impaired with services and programs in American Sign Language. At the public hearing in March, um, three people spoke in support of the proposed designation, including um, Father Luis Luis Barrios, priest in charge of the Holy Rood Iglesia Santa Cruz, and representatives of the New York Landmarks Conservancy and the Historic Districts Council. There was no testimony in opposition to the proposed designation. And additionally, LPC received a letter of support from Co Manhattan Community Board 12. Cited on the corner of West 179th Street and Fort Washington Avenue, the freestanding church is located directly across the street from the George Washington Bridge bus station. <clears throat> and the proposed landmark site consists of the full tax lot. Holyrood Parish was established in 1893 by Reverend William O. Embry, a chaplain at a nearby home for girls. Henry C. Potter, the Episcopal Bishop, um, at that time encouraged the establishment of additional parishes within the diocese as the population of the city increased dramatically. Holyrood was established in Upper Manhattan anticipating the population growth that was to follow in the next 20 years. In 1895, the congregation built its first church, Stone Here, a rambling stone building in a country setting at that time. The 1898 fire insurance map in the middle 
of this slide shows its location at Broadway and West 181st Street. In 1911, the congregation bought property along Fort Washington Avenue for the site of the present day church, indicated by the green triangle um, on each of these maps. The first service was held in 1913 in a partially constructed sanctuary shown in the map on the right. This map also shows the residential development of the neighborhood by 1913, so you can really see how fast that change was. Holyrood's new church was designed by William F. Bannister and Richard M. Schell, a firm that designed a broad range of buildings in New York City, including many religious structures. Completed in 1916 and dedicated in 1917, Holyrood Church became one of the most impressive and beautiful churches in the neighborhood. Shown here are the two primary facades, the front facade facing west and the south facade that incorporates a parish house, which is visible at the right. Holyrood Church quickly gained a reputation for inclusiveness and humanitarian causes. In 1919, shortly after the new church was dedicated, the congregation welcomed Gustav Carsonson as their rector. He had previously resigned from his former parish because they did not welcome black children from a nearby orphan asylum to the worship services. He was known in his day as very progressive and often came to support causes that were unpopular with his fellow clergy in the diocese. As noted in his obituary in 1941, under his leadership, the Holyrood Church became one of the leading churches in Washington Heights, and its ministry and outreach programs continue to champion inclusiveness to this day. During the 1920s and 30s, the neighborhood attracted a large number of Greeks, Irish, and Jewish people who settled there in increasing numbers, many escaping political turmoil in Europe. In the 1950s and 60s, the area began to attract a large population of Spanish-speaking people, with many coming from Puerto Rico and Cuba. During the 1960s, the parish started offering Spanish services to the community. By the 1980s, Dominicans became the dominant Spanish-speaking cultural group in Northern Manhattan. Political changes beginning in the 1960s finally, finally allowed people to leave the Dominican Republic after many years of repression. They settled in Washington Heights, where the cost of housing was more affordable and public transportation provided convenient links to lower Manhattan. The Dominican Day Parade began in 1981 in Washington Heights, celebrating their culture and contributions to the city. By 2000, the Latino population represented 75% of the population in Washington Heights and Inwood, with Dominicans making up the majority of those residents. In 2018, the neighborhood was officially honored at Little Dominican Republic. The ceremony shown here highlights this commercial and cultural designation. In response to the large Dominican population, the church has provided facilities for the Dominican Women's Development Center, an independent nonprofit that advances gender equality, social justice, education, and similar causes. Today, the parish has become actively involved in many humanitarian programs, but is particularly known for its new sanctuary program, offering a safe haven and help for immigrants in need. In addition, the parish has recently recently um, added services for the hearing impaired. The church just celebrated its 125th anniversary and has continued to serve as an anchor and resource to the residents of the predominantly Latino neighborhood. Recently, the church included Iglesia Santa Cruz as part of its name to express its dual identity. The medieval English word Holy Rood and the Spanish Santa Cruz both translate to Holy Cross. Uh, in 2012, an article about the parish noted, our members represent the diversity of the neighborhood, mostly Latino, some West Indians, and some Anglo professionals. Coming back to the design of the church, um, the architectural design is a Gothic revival style that was often preferred by the Episcopal Church with its 19th century interest in English medieval architecture. The front facing gable terminates a tall nave with buttressed side aisles and clear story windows. Tall pinnacles frame the main window and extend far beyond the parapet, creating a striking appearance in the skyline. Articles written about the new building when it opened reported that its design was inspired by Hereford Cathedral shown here on the right. And indeed the West End is remarkably similar. 
Dominating the entrance facade is an impressive tall arch stained glass window with delicate geometric stone tracery. The filigree Gothic details in terracotta at the front facade contrast dramatically with the quarry faced stone along the south facade that has a more rugged appearance. A narrow parking lot to the north of the church building was originally intended to accommodate a small chapel that was never built. Minor alterations include signage and security lighting, a replacement side doors, window protectors covering historic windows and tracery, and the installation of ramps and railings for universal access to the sanctuary and side entrances. Today, Holyrood Church Iglesia Santa Cruz is remarkably intact with excellent integrity of design and materials. This outstanding example of a Gothic revival church, um, excuse me, <laughs> Uh, da -da. has served Washington Heights since its construction over a hundred years ago and continues to serve the diverse, predominantly Latino community, offering services and programs in Spanish as well as English. During the past 40 years, it has expanded its community outreach and continues its tradition of humanitarian and culturally diverse programs. The research staff recommends the commission vote to designate Holy Rood Episcopal Church Iglesia Santa Cruz as an, ind an individual New York City landmark. Um, and Mary Ann Hurley from the research staff who wrote our report and this presentation is also here with me today for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions on this item or comments? If you'd like to start a discussion, we can do that if anyone would like to say anything. I think, you know, I. I, uh, I can kick it off. Um, as I said earlier, this item was calendared in January along with the two other items on our research agenda today when we introduced the agency's equity framework to prioritize designations that represent New York City's diversity and tell the story of all New Yorkers. And so to me, this represents the wonderful combination of architectural significance of its beautiful Gothic revival architecture, which has been so well preserved with its historic and cultural significance, given its longstanding and important role in Washington Heights and its Latino community. And it highlights the role of property owners in caring for their buildings, not only as physical structures, but as places that make a meaningful difference in their community. And I especially wanna thank Father Barrios for his enthusiastic support for designation and for all of the information that he's shared with us about his church. Um, I, I'm delighted that it's here today. Uh, I'd also like to thank Marianne Hurley for all of her work on this proposal today and, and Kate for your leadership on this. So um, if there aren't any other questions, oh yes, Commissioner Bland, please go ahead. Can I just make a comment? Um, yes, please. Um, it's wonderful to see such a beautiful and well-preserved um, church um, outside, one might say the mainstream of, um, uh, of where churches seem to be able to be maintained well. There's so many that are not in our city, and it's a very troublesome problem, I think. But I just wanted to say that uh, this, this church, you know, founded as an Episcopalian church, probably with mostly white people, uh, has been completely changed along with its neighborhood, but the building is still intact and beautiful. And I just want to um, acknowledge my own ignorance 35 years ago when I started to work in the Lower East Side on, um, uh, on a synagogue, not knowing that most of the synagogues on the Lower East Side were founded as churches. This, this happened to be a Baptist church that converted itself over time because of the changing nature of, uh, of the neighborhood uh, into a synagogue. And so this represents just this long standing and very positive trend in our city uh, of, of institutions and houses of worship being um, taken over, if you will, that sounds uh, like a bad term, but it's a good term, taken over and cared for and used again uh, by a new population. And I just think this is a, a wonderful example of that and it's not new and I just hope it continues because we have so many uh, houses of wor worship um, uh, in distress and it's a real problem I think for the for the landmarks commission to deal with and our city to deal with so thank you 
Great, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, I, just to follow up on Commissioner Bland's comment, um, it, the throughout the city, there are um, religious structures of all um, all denominations um, that um, that form something of the backbone of um, of neighborhoods. You know, we refer to this as a social and religious anchor currently um, for the Latino community, but it has been um, a social and religious um, anchor um, in the community for um, a number of different um, generations prior to that as well. Um, and 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 the you know being, being a non-architect on this um, um, on this commission, um, I, I think that um, I commend the um, um, the architecture, the architects who um, who see who foresee um, the importance of the structure and how um, when you develop a structure this significant in a small community, um, it becomes something bigger than than merely a place to worship. It becomes um, an anchor, and it's a wonderful word for for the community. And it's the um, and it's the foresight of a leadership in a religious community working together with an architect to create that anchor. So there's something more dramatic and more important about it um, um, uh, that goes alongside um, that that important function it plays in the community. I couldn't agree more. I real I think that you know this architecture is so beautifully executed and designed and it represents not only the anchor of a community but really the heart of a community and and again in this case father barrios is just it opened it up and continues to um, welcome the community and is constantly looking for new ways to expand that outreach and that and in, in engagement with communities so um, you know the leader current leadership has um, really embraced this as the heart of the community and, and continuing to expand it. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I just want to agree with you and my fellow commissioners. Uh, we have a local Episcopal church, uh, which is very, very diverse in um, today in uh, my neighborhood of Jackson Heights and uh, also a local community church, which is largely of uh, uh, Korean population and many and other groups as well, and th that community church and the other church are both very actively working with all of the people in the community in a very positive way, which is terrific to see. And this is a great uh, designation today. Great, thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. Since we're piling on. Um, <laughs> No, I, I just, f following my fellow commissioners discussions, um, you know, one of the things that is most troubling to me, we, we have several churches on our client list at this point, and we've worked with them for years and years and years. And we tend to have to do that because there is no church that ever has the financial resources to do everything that they need done at one time. And I, I'm, I'm immediately I'm, I'm thinking of the uh, old first Dutch Reformed Church here in Park Slope that we, we helped several years ago. They had a $1.5 million interior restoration that was necessary. Part of the ceiling collapsed. And the Reverend Daniel Meter said to me in a meeting one day, well, I just want you to tell me why I should spend $1.5 million on the building when I could put those $1.5 million into our outreach programs. And I was, I was caught, I was taken aback a, a second by that, but I, I was able to convince him that his building was as important as a symbol in the neighborhood as anything else. And, and so I, I guess, what I what I'd like to say one thing I would like to say is is kudos to to Father Barrios for actually taking this on because there there are issues that have to do with appropriate restorations with churches that um, are costly. I I would also like to put in a great word for the Landmarks Conservancy, the New York Landmarks Conservancy that funds restoration projects on churches like this. And I would also like to put a little stick in the side of, of New York City to somehow eventually create 
um, a pool of money that, that owners of historic resources can come to for either low cost loans or grants to assist in restoring our religious and other historic properties. And now I'll shut up. Sorry, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Well, great. Uh, yes, Commissioner Bland, please go ahead again. Since, since we're on this interesting topic, I'll just sh share one more uh, thought. It's a little, a little extraneous, but um, Commissioner Devonshire just brought it up, and I want to suggest there probably is at least one church, and maybe only one church in the city that does have the resources, uh, thanks to uh, Queen Anne, who gave the farm uh, 250 acres of lower Manhattan to Trinity Church in 1705. Um, and Trinity, like so many other institutions, faced the same issue, even though its resources are kind of extraordinary, of mission versus building. And it was so startling to me that the last two rectors of Trinity Church, number 17 and number 18, in the whole history of the, of the church there at Broadway and Wall Street, told me when I was kind of dealing with this issue as part of the uh, vestry, I was on the vestry, and both of them agreed that the mission of Trinity had to include the preservation of all of its properties, of, of which you know are extensive, including a cemetery. So it's, it was very gratifying to me, um, Michael Devonshire, to hear for the first time ever that, the, that, that these things were conflated and not separate and not uh, oppositional. So anyway, that was a very good thing to hear. And I hope that sort of uh, mood can continue uh, and protocol can continue in institutions. Thank you, and now I will shut up. No, not at, please. All of these comments are very helpful and important. Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. <coughs> I think the community should be really proud because this is a symbol and it's a presence of, of their commitment in, in this neighborhood, and it, it reflects their their how do I put it, their passion to show, to, to, I'm out of words. I mean, everything has been said, but I mean, this, this is such a community effort at this time and place. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's just an example of how the architecture and the mission is, and the um, spirit of the community and thanks to the leadership of the of the church really are all intertwined and the architecture embodies that spirit in the community and vice versa. So I think it's great. And, you know, it really is, um, you know, a beautiful building and it really stands out on this corner in, in this neighborhood. Um, so with that, I would like to, what yes. I say, you, said, you said it better than I did, much better. Sorry, say that again. You said that much better than I did. Oh, no. Well, I got it from, i channeling you. <laughs> I got it from you. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think um, we'll make a motion to vote and uh, call the vote after that. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you read the motion? Uh, I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate Holy Rood Episcopal Church, Iglesias Santa Cruz, 715 West 179th Street, also known as 715 721 West 179th Street, 426 to 434 Fort Washington Avenue, Borough of Manhattan, as a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development heritage and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP 2649, dated May 18, 2021. I also move that Borough of Manhattan tax map block 2176, lot 30, be designated as its landmark site. 
Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. <laughs> Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay. Aye. Ten in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. Great. Thank you. So the Holy Root Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, is now an official New York City landmark. Thank you all. We'll move to the next item. Great. Item two is LP 2650. The Educational Building, 75th Avenue, AKA 2 to 6 West 13th Street, Manhattan, Block 576, Lot 36. Item proposed for designation is a 12 story Beaux Arts style loft building built circa 1914 that contained the national offices of the NAACP from 1914 to 1923, as well as many other progressive organizations. The Educational Building, 75th Avenue, was constructed between 1912 and 1914, commissioned by George Arthur Plimpton, Plimpton excuse me, a successful book publisher and philanthropist. This 12-story office and loft building housed the National Office of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, as well as a remarkable group of tenant organizations that shaped American thought and society, including several that remain active and influential today. At the public hearing on May 23rd, 15 people testified in favor of the proposed designation, including representatives of the New School, Speaker of the New York City Council, Corey Johnson, New York State Assembly Member Deborah Glick, State Senator Brad Hoyleman, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Manhattan Community Board 2, the Armenian Bar Association, Historic Districts Council, J. Rosamond Johnson Foundation, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Victorian Society of New York, and Village Preservation. No one spoke in opposition to designation. Some speakers also testified in support of further landmark designation south of Union Square. The commission has also received more than 85 written submissions in support of the proposed designation. On the southwest corner of West 13th Street in Greenwich Village, the educational building, 75th Avenue, occupies an L-shaped lot. And the proposed landmark site is that full lot shown here. The NAACP is one of the oldest and largest civil rights organizations in the United States. Founded in New York City by mostly white reformers in 1909, it sought to fight racism through legal and educational means. The National Office leased offices at 75th Avenue for almost 10 years from February 1914 to June 1923. Initially located on the fifth floor, it moved to the sixth floor in 1919. This was an especially important chapter in the association's early development and history. During the post-reconstruction uh, era, when racist Jim Crow laws and practices buttressed discrimination and segregation, the NAACP grew nationwide during this period and launched a series of effective campaigns against segregation, race discrimination, and mob violence, particularly the horrendous practice of lynching, which escalated following the revival of the Ku Klux Klan in the mid 1910s. The director of research and publicity, um, the prominent African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, um, seen at the right in his office at 75th Avenue, was a founder of the organization and editor of its influential, influential journal, The Crisis. Du Bois founded The Crisis in 1910 and was its editor until 1934. This popular and self-supporting magazine, which had a paid circulation of more than 100,000 readers by 1919, had offices in 75th Avenue and continues to publish today. This influential publication contained monthly columns and news reports about NAACP's activities, as well as contributions from noteworthy artists and writers associated with the Harlem Renaissance. 
In 1920 and 21, Du Bois and Augustus Granville Dill operated an independent publishing company in the building, Du Bois and Dill, which published the Brownies book, the first magazine specifically written for young African-American readers. Du Bois wanted them to be proud of their race and knowledgeable about their history and achievements. Published monthly, the pages were filled with positive imagery and stories by notable black authors. Langston Hughes, for instance, made his debut in the Brownies book in 1921. In various issues of the magazine, he contributed a poem, a play, a short story, and nonfiction pieces. One of the most important figures in the national office was James Weldon Johnson. A former diplomat and skilled tactician, he organized the memorable silent march down Fifth Avenue in 1917 to protest violence against Black people in St. Louis and Memphis. And as field secretary, he oversaw the establishment of hundreds of new local branches, including many in Southern states. In 1920, he was appointed executive secretary, making him the first African-American to lead the NAACP. Under Johnson's leadership, the Dyer Bill to make lynching a federal crime was passed by the US House of Representatives in 1922, but it was blocked by filibuster in the Senate. Though nearly a century would pass before a similar law would finally win passage, the NAACP's campaign played an important role in confronting the issue and raising the association's national profile. The NAACP and the Crisis Magazine moved to 69 Fifth Avenue at the northeast corner of 40, 14th Street in July, 1923. That building, which has since been demolished, was the location of the NAACP office when it hung the now famous banner, A Man Was Lynched Yesterday, from a window in 1936 as part of the organization's continued campaign against lynching. 75th Avenue is visible in this photograph to the south, identified by the green arrow. In the years leading up to World War I, the educational building attracted a great number of peace advocates. There were so many groups, in fact, that newspapers sometimes called it the Peace Building. Plimpton, the building's owner, was a trustee in the World Peace Foundation and the Church Peace Union, now the Carnegie Council, which was active at 75th Avenue for several decades. He also provided office space at no charge to the New York branch of the Women's Peace Party, which was founded in 1915 by the suffragists Jane Addams and Carrie Chapman Pat. Tenants with similar interests included the American Neutral Conference Committee, the League to Enforce Peace, the New York Peace Society, and the Emergency Peace Federation. Another noteworthy group was the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief, now called the Near East Foundation. This group's secretary and treasurer were tenants and multiple meetings were held at the Church Peace Union in 1915 and 1916. The American Civil Liberties Union also traces its beginnings to the educational building. Initially called the National Civil Liberties Bureau, it was founded in New York City by the American Union Against Militarism, a pacifist group headed by Lillian Wald and Crystal Eastman to provide legal advice and representation to conscientious objectors following passage of the Selective Service Act of 1917. Evicted following raids by the Justice Department in 1918, it was soon relaunched as the ACLU. Today, this organization has offices in every state and more than a million members. Another notable tenant was the National Board of Review, founded by the People's Institute in 1909 and originally called the National Board of Censorship. For several decades, all films that gained its approval were accompanied by a screen label passed by the National Board of Review. This organization also sponsored publications devoted to film criticism, such as Film Program, uh, now called Films in Review. This influential magazine remains in print and the oldest periodical of its kind in the United States. The Plimpton family sold 75th Avenue in 1946. In subsequent years, it had several owners, including the educational publisher, Prentice Hall, and real estate developer, Jack Browse, who published this brochure shown here. The building's architect was Charles A. Rich, formerly of the noted firm Lamb & Rich. 
An understated example of the Beaux-Arts style, the white brick and possibly cast stone elevations display a tripartite configuration, consisting of a three-story base, an eight-story midsection, and a two-story crown. Most of the original neoclassical ornament is well-preserved, including the door surrounds, pilasters, composite capitals, relief panels, keystones, rounded pediments, and an extensive terracotta cornice. In reference to Plimpton's publishing company and the various educational tenants, the door surrounds that face West 13th Street display cartouches that frame small images of open books while some bays on the uppermost floors have iron grills with gilded book reliefs. The New School for Social Research acquired 75th Avenue in 1972. A significant institution with close associations to Greenwich Village, it was founded in 1919 as a progressive center for adult education and now incorporates five colleges. The building was sensitively renovated in 2005 to six and is currently part of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at the Parsons School of Design slash the New School. The award-winning renovation modified the show windows on the first floor and enlarged the West 13th Street entrance. The well-preserved educational building is historically significant as the former national office of the NAACP in the early 20th century as well as many significant organizations that advanced social justice and equality, a legacy carried on for almost 50 years by the new school. The research department recommends the commission vote to designate the building a New York City landmark. And Matt Postel from the research department who wrote our report and this presentation is here with me as well to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions for Kate or Matt? Okay, I'm going to start to unmute you all in, uh, in case we want to have a discussion and as we move toward our vote. Um, any thoughts or comments? Yes, Commissioner Shamir Barron. You know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm really moved by this, um, this designation, it, in part because I think I've had some kind of, um, I've both understood and had a kind of a difficult time with cultural, with cultural um, landmarks, really getting my kind of head around it. And, and I can't, and I can't say that I'm, I'm fully there yet um, in understanding, you know, truly what distinguishes one, one building from the next, because everything's got the kind of the weight of history in terms of its its occupation and, and you know and, and its cultural life, but um, ever since we uh, we learned more and I and I did not know all of this history about this building. Um, I, I live a few blocks away. Every time I walk by and look at those open book cartouches, I'm I'm kind of welled up with um, with a sense of uh, of the building's kind of haunt. It's the kind of the depth of intellectual, political activity, the, the ways that those two things, the intellectual production and political engagement are and can be and have been profoundly aligned in certain times in, uh, for the force of good. And, um, and I just, I can't kind of get away from the, that kind of vibe from the physical building every time I'm, I'm in its presence. And so I'm just, it just gets me closer to an, a, a, an understanding of cultural landmarks, um, maybe not a kind of clarity on, on what the boundaries or the regulatory definitions are, but I, I really understand it as it relates to this building. And I'm, and I'm um, very, um, it's just very moved that we're engaged in, in protecting it and, um, and consecrating it um, well, for the future. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, again, I think an example of how the you know, architecture conveys the history, its history and cultural significance and really embodies it. And you know, so I moved listening to you talk about walking by and looking at those cartouches. I think that's, that's I think, kind of the definition of the landmark, right? Yeah. Any other comments? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. I think, I think Commissioner Sharon, but I'm sorry, but it's bad. 
Chuck said it all. I mean, the, the emotion and feeling of walking down the block and suddenly realizing because of, in addition to the architecture, what the cultural imprint in that building is, it's just, you know, it's just an emotional response you know, that we get. I get when I pass by this. Thank you, Commissioner Bland. Uh, well, for 15 years, Buyer Blender Bell, my firm, uh, was located at number 80 Fifth Avenue, uh, the very same location on the very next block at the corner of 14th Street and Fifth Avenue on the, on the top floor. Uh, not a dissimilar building to this. Um, so I know it very well, too. I walked by it almost daily for 15 years and still... Um, Still go to a barber very nearby and see it all the time. It's a great part of the city. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to bring up a, a, a sore wound here, but I will explain for me uh, that number 70 uh, warrants uh, designation and saving uh, as opposed to 14 to 16 Fifth Avenue, just a few blocks away. Um, and it's a, it's a subtle distinction I accept. And I think, but I think it's an important thing for us to continue to talk about at the commission uh, over the uh, oncoming years, because this is gonna be more and more what I think we talk about. But for me, this building not only is a staggeringly beautiful and important physical building, um, maybe even worth designation on its own, but then when you combine uh, not just you know, important wealthy people living there, but important institutions that changed the direction of our country and our city. Um, to me, that is just a higher bar, I suppose. But it's a it's a it's a complicated subject, and I know that we we had our famous split vote just a week ago on this topic, and this will not be the only time that we have to confront um, uh, this issue and you know, there's, there's plenty of, of good on both sides. So anyway, I just wanted to say what this sort of illustrates exactly the divide for me, at least. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted about this um, designation today. Great. Thank you. And I think it is helpful to continue to kind of think about it, articulate, um, uh, you know, what, what, what we do all the time internally and, and what Kate does um, in, as leading the research department and thinking about um, significance and what the criteria are and what the um, parameters are, so eligibility parameters. Okay, others. All right, and I mean, I'm I'm thrilled we're bringing this forward for a vote today. Um, 75th Avenue is a place of tremendous significance, uh, given its association with the NAACP and the confluence of influence, influential organizations located here. And that's a legacy that has been honored and carried on by the new school for almost 50 years. And I, I think, um, Fred, you, s you sort of hit on it a little bit with the sort of it, the location of it being a location of the organizations and institutions. And I think um, when we did our LGBT initiative, and while we did do some homes of very important and significant people, we really looked at it, the uh, framework um, from a point of view of, of people and institutions and organizations that were change agents that really influenced um, the future. So. I think that's what we see here. And um, designation would recognize the incredible, important work of, and contributions of the NAACP and so many of the other organizations that advanced causes of peace, social justice, and equity here. Um, and I also, I wanna thank Kate again for your leadership on this. And, and as we continue to think about other um, potential designations that represent the incredibly important, diverse and cultural history of our city and Matt Postal for all of the research work and writing the in and preparing of this presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank the Village Preservation for their research and advocacy and to the New School for their stewardship of this building and their full support of this designation. So with that, I think I'd like to have us make a, a move to the motion. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you read the motion? Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Um, motion to designate the educational building at 75th Avenue in Manhattan. I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate the educational building 75th Avenue, 75th Avenue's AKA. A26 West 13th Street in the borough of Manhattan as a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation as set forth in the designation report for LP2650 dated May 18, 2021. I also move that the borough of Manhattan tax mat Tax map block 576, lot 36, be designated as its landmark site. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I second the motion. Thank you. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. That's great. So, 75th Avenue, the educational building, is now an official New York City landmark. Couldn't be happier. Thank you all. We'll now move to the Preservation Department agenda. Hey, thanks, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. We'll take just a brief pause to uh, make sure we have everyone ready for to begin the meeting. <coughs> okay. All right, we're going to start today's preservation department agenda with two public meeting items. The first is public meeting item number one, LPC 19-41516, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 216, lot 13, 56 Middock Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. This is a federal style house with Greek revival style details built in 1829. The application is to construct a new building on a portion of the lot adjacent to the historic building. This was last presented at the public hearing of uh, December 12th, uh, sorry, December 8th, 2020, and no action was taken at that time. The applicants have returned to present a revised proposal uh, after the staff makes a brief introduction uh, and all of that after we open the proceedings. Uh, we'll go ahead and open the proceedings now. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the proceedings are open and the applicants may speak after the staff introduces the presentation. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Amy Wooden, Preservation Staff. The application before you today is to construct a new building at a portion of the lot adjacent to 56 Middaw Street located on the south side of Minnow Street between Henry and Hicks Streets in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Uh, there was historically a building adjacent to 56 Minnow that sat proud of the extant building. Um, there's a 40s tax photo within the presentation that will show that. The project was originally shown to the commission on January 14th, 2020. At that time, the new building was proposed as a three-story building with a large dormer and a garage at the base, all clad with synthetic wood clapboards. The commission expressed concerns at that time with the typology and proposed materials of the design. The proposal was completely revised and then presented at a public hearing on December 8th, 2020. The new design as shown in the previously proposed elevations features a four-story building clad in buff brick and cast stone with a set back fourth floor and three-story bay. The commissioners present were concerned about the massing, materiality and details of that design and we're open to different approaches, including a wood frame building, a simplified brick house, or something very unique and contemporary, but noted that each approach would have its own certain set of features and proportions to be contextual. 
Um, the applicants have revised their proposal along the guidance of the simplified brick house and are here to present their revised design after the proceedings are opened. And the applicants are being given control of the presentation. And we'll just go back to the first slide. And you now have control of the presentation. Um, if you just click to advance the slides and you may begin. And please remember to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Okay. So I couldn't find the unmute button. Uh, format change a little bit. Hi there, good morning. Uh, my name is David Black. This is my partner, Elizabeth Pratt. We are Pratt and Black Architects, and we are here to present our proposal for a new single family townhouse on the uh, empty portion of the lot at 56 Middog. Um, so let's see, we're starting with this. I'm just seeing how I change. How do I make it? Okay. I was just a little slow responding. Okay, so this is the, obviously this is uh, Mid-Aug Street. Uh, it's a very varied uh, block. It's very interesting. It has a, everything from single family uh, residences to apartment buildings. There's a school, a candy factory, a church on the block, a uh, firehouse, um, and we've studied uh, all these buildings and, and the rest of the neighborhood. This is our little property right here. Uh, as you can see, there's a new, relatively new uh, apartment building, fire firehouse, an old candy factory, very interesting street. Um, this, these are the historic photos. This is the existing Clavert House, which is still there. There was an old sort of a cedar shingle building that's uh, since been torn down. Um, we have very simple plans. We're happy to go over those. Uh, if there are any questions later on, we can review those. Um, so here's our uh, revised presentation. Um, it's a much uh, simplified uh, brick. It's a uh, three-story brick building with a basement. Um, it's currently, so the area is zoned uh, for a maximum height of 50 feet, which we think that these adjacent buildings are. Ours comes up to 40, the top of the parapet is 45 feet. So this is the this is north the elevation. elevation. As you can see, we've simplified the massing. We have uh, larger windows. We have a, a larger cornice. Uh, we have a stone base that wraps around the, the building. This is the, uh, the east elevation, which wraps around. This is the old Clavert House. At the top, we mitigated the massing by yeah. having a railing along the There's side. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't remember because I never did it. On the west elevation, we have brick again wrapping around. This is a, a one-story garage on the adjacent property. On the uh, south exterior elevation, we have a, just a cementitious uh, uh, stucco. We've added some lot line windows. And on we have a recessed uh, top floor with a terrace. Again, we have the railing here and the railing above, and we have a window wall with a, a door to the terrace on the top. So this is the, the top is the existing streetscape. This is the open lot. This is the adjacent garage. That's not our property. This is the existing Clapper house. And here's how our uh, sort of simplified uh, masonry townhouse uh, fits into the, into the street. 
this shows this is our previous uh, proposal from December, and this is the same. This is our new simplified townhouse. Um, again, we made as from the comments uh, from the commissioners, we made the, the larger cornice, larger windows, simplified elevation, um, a brick. It's a it's a red brick to blend in with the neighborhood, uh, and the stone stone base, and it's a a natural stone that we're proposing. Again, this is a comparison. This is our proposal on the right. That was the older on the left. The same. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the, the floor, the height of the building is the same. We just extended the parapet up on the front a little bit to have a nice pronounced cornice. These are the comparison of the old, the old over here and the new. The rear is much more activated with the windows and the terrace at the top. And then the previous one, we had the cementitious uh, stucco on the side, and now we've extended the brick all the way around the side. Because uh, we don't know, someone could possibly build, this is a site where someone could build, but it may be a while, we really don't know. So we want to have a nice brick on the side. Uh, we have extensive details showing uh, fairly traditional masonry building with uh, with natural stone uh, accents and base. We did a, a lot of studies of the neighborhood. Um, and this is the this is Midog Street. We did a very thorough study of Midog Street and all the undulations and ins and outs. Uh, this is a very interesting street. We have everything from, you know, sort of a there's concrete stoop. There's wood fencing on the adjacent, and there's wood fencing down the block a little bit. There's iron grills, uh, and then even you know brick low walls. And these are all extending beyond the, the property line onto the sidewalk. Um, and we're proposing really just a couple of steps and a, a flower, a little flower uh, planter in front of our building. And then we also did very typical um, detailed studies of the neighborhood. This is all photos that we took um, in Brooklyn Heights. Um, and there are obviously so many different types of uh, buildings. We sort of chose the ones that were more similar to what we're proposing. Uh, as you can see, they typically have large uh, windows. Um, windows are, are oftentimes uh, ganged together at the parlor level. Um, and uh, almost all the buildings have substantial cornices. Um, the cornices differ from building to bear building, but within the building type, they, all, they always relate to the detailing of the building. Um, there's typically a change of material at the basement level, um, you can see there's a, either a stucco or a stone at the basement level. Also, uh, you can see that casement windows are not uncommon uh, in this area, in this neighborhood. Um, and this, are, this is our palette of materials, very simple. We have a natural stone at the base. It's in, uh, called autumn brown. It is a uh, quartzite. Um, it's a quartzite sandstone it, with a natural cleft finish. And then this is, these are both pictures of the brick. This is an actual sample that we took at the site with a sample of the stone that we have. And this is the same just from the, from their website. And then the, we're having black for the, the windows and for the cornice, black metal. So these are uh, renderings. This is the older scheme. This is our proposed, again, the brick wrapping around the side, um, pronounced cornice. We weren't able to show the railing here on the side. There will be railing. Uh, it was a last minute decision. We weren't able to get it rendered properly. Um, and then you can see the, the stone at the base. 
Uh, and this is the other view. This is our proposal at the bottom. And then just a, an enlarged. This is looking uh, southeast. And then looking southwest. Uh, so we've given some nice spacing between the, the windows and um, hopefully you know, pay very close attention to, de to the detailing and we feel like this is uh, an appropriate um, proposal. We hope that you like it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, Commissioner Lusty, please go ahead. Oh, Commissioner Lusty, did you have a question? She's still muted. It just, yeah, just ah. accept my request. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, so a material, I have a materials question. Um, in terms of the facade, uh, the rear, what it, in, in terms of the back of the buildings on this row, what materials most commonly used? So this this is a rendering, but this is accurate. This is, and that's not the rear, this is the side. You can see that there's- um, Yeah, I'm talking about the rear. The rear is the same. It's, it's a, just like on this building as well, the sides and the rear are typically uh, a cementitious stucco. They are. Yes. Uh, oh, for yeah, I think you might want to just actually explain this, um, as you may recall, is sort of an unusual lot and the lot of the adjacent building wraps around it. So this building doesn't have a rear yard. So it, it wouldn't necessarily fit into a row. But I think, uh, Mr. Black, if you could just talk a little bit about the predominant material on the rear facades in general within this block that face the rear yards. Right. So... Well, the, the, the rear um, the rear is not really very visible. This is an unusual, if I could just go back to the site plan real quick. Um, it's an unusual block because there's actually a church that goes right through the, um, through the block. So you don't really have a traditional, this is a church that cuts the block right in half. So you don't have, you have a bit of a traditional, you know, the donut over here that you see and over here is this is this is our building right there. This is another property that goes all the way across. You don't really have much of an open space back here, but from what we found, that the backs are traditionally just a, a stucco finish. Okay, and then oh, go ahead, Sarah. You wanted to. Well, I, I think probably or some were likely brick that have been stuccoed over. Um, but just, were you saying that this property that um, goes behind you, it, it, that, does the building go to the rear lot line in that case? In other words, are you, does your building abut or come close to the, another wall? No, th this is, this is okay. open. This is That's their, what I thought, okay. They have the, their they backyard. Have maintain their 30 feet distance from this lot line. So this part will be open. Um, but we, this is still, for us, this is still the lot line. Yes, got that. I'm just trying to understand if you see this from within the rear yards. Maybe okay, a couple. Commissioner Lutfi. There's do also a big tree back here. See it or no? What was the question? No, do you see it from the rear, the other rear yards or, or no? You don't, yeah. You do? Yes, you do. Yes. 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 Okay. And then, and I have a question about the front, uh, material on the front, the, uh, at the base, the court site. Is that, is that a material that's found in the neighborhood? So traditionally, um, these townhouses were done with brownstone, but brownstone we found is no longer quarried uh, or not in, not in <coughs> substantial quantities. We can't really um, get that right now. This stone that we're proposing is a stone that we found that we thought was very beautiful and we liked, and it looks a lot like the brownstone. 
Um, it looks to me like a lot, a lot of, uh, and it is a sandstone, it's a quartzite sandstone, which is very common in this area. Um, although not necessarily this particular stone. Um, but a lot of it is actually, we've noticed there, there's a lot of cast stone and there's a lot of stucco at the bases. So it's not always even stone. I, I have one, one comment to add about, about this. Um, originally we had proposed a cast stone and we were um, at, the, at the base, uh, you know, imagining we would do a, uh, a, a parging um, of the, uh, of, of a concrete, um, you know, sub material um, to replicate the look of the brownstone without actually using it. And that's something that we've done in, in restoring uh, landmark uh, brownstones uh, on the Upper East Side, for example. And we can see that that's sort of how people have been treating uh, the brownstones in, in the area. Um, the, uh, the LPC um, staff had recommended that instead of going with cast stone, that we should go with a natural material. Um, so we did look uh, throughout the area to see, you know, examples of, of natural material. Um, there are limestones that are being used. Um, <clears throat> our client was interested in replicating brownstone and in uh, <clears throat> researching those options, while we couldn't go to the, you know, New Jersey um, Palisades to, to get the actual original sandstone, uh, we, we did find this material, this autumn brown, which, which uh, is sort of the closest match uh, to it. And so we felt that also it would blend more than doing a sort of bright limestone. Um, and so just, just basically elaborating on the, the decision for, for this particular stone. Okay, thank you. That's, that's thank our you, staff. other questions? Yes, Commissioner Holford smith yeah, along the same lines. Is that is that stone material available in a more of a honed finish? Um, probably. Uh, it's a, it's available in in every finish. It, yeah, I think that might be a little more typical of what you would find in uh, original brownstone. Um, so that would be fine. We, yeah, we would be happy with the with the honed finish. Okay, thanks. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. There's a question of intent. Um, your sills, they're cast stone, I suppose, um, in this drawing, but in your, in your section, you have brick. So the question was whether, I think the, the cast stone is your intention. So I was asking, did you at one point think of using brick sills? Or is that just a, that's a, that's a I mean, yeah, that's a really good catch, actually. I just realized that too, that the, the details are showing brick. That's absolutely correct. And that was something we were exploring originally, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. We, the intent is that this would be uh, the same stone or a cast stone to match. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's very astute. Okay. I didn't even say that. <laughs> Other questions? All right. I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. Let me see if we've received any additional letters on the revised proposal. Um, Rich, can you summarize? I think we did get one, but let me know if there are other letters um, that, or comments that we've received on this revised proposal. Sure. So, yes, we received one letter from HDC and they remain in opposition. Thank you. And, uh, Commissioner, those, that letter was shared with you, as, as you know. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll move to our discussion. I'm not seeing any other questions. So um, we'll go ahead and, and as we noted, this is sort of an unusual site in that small footprint site and the lot for the adjacent building wraps around it or the, the building on the, around the corner. And um, while it is unusually small, it did historically have a building on it. It had a small wood frame building on it. Um, and so the applicants, this is actually their third time presenting to us. They had um, proposed a building here. And I think that 
Um, the commission has indicated that a building would be appropriate on this lot. And, um, and, and last time uh, had a discussion about the use of brick and sort of looking to the rest of the street as opposed to the neighboring building for inspiration. And so the applicants have come back um, with this revised proposal that simplifies the massing and the fenestration. And um, I think um, they've presented some examples of uh, some of the other row houses on the street and in the neighborhood and to talk about what informed their decisions. And so they're back today. Um, so we'll begin our discussion and um, Commissioner Bland is our Brooklyn Heights Commissioner. Would you like to start this one? Yeah, certainly. Um, as has been pointed out, Sarah, by you and, and the applicant's uh, architect here, um, it's not only an interesting and unusual site, but it's an interesting and unusual street and block. Um, not only a polyglot of, of uh, array of building types and, and, uh, and uh, historical time periods, um, including some really old uh, wooden houses um, that we see next door here, uh, but lots, lots of open space too, which means that the, um, you know, the, the schoolyard and other pieces of open space uh, sort of bleed in and make this not a, a cohesive sort of street that you typically do see in, in um, Brooklyn Heights. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's been a long and winding road, but to me, we're just about there. Um, I think uh, the right approach here has been to uh, separate itself uh, distinctly different from the wooden house uh, to which it could be attached because it's in the same ownership as I understand. Um, so I think this approach is the right one. Um, I don't need to belabor it. I think they've done a nice job of showing how this uh, building is, is a response to the, let's call it the vernacular of um, townhouses in, in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, I didn't ask the question, but I had the same questions about the material <clears throat> uh, in the front. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little worried about the, 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 uh, the, the base sandstone material. But I think working with staff, they can certainly uh, get that uh, absolutely right. It may be right because there's so much um, reconstituted brownstone stucco, let's call it, uh, that, that that could be the approach. But I leave it, in my judgment, I would leave that to staff to work with, with them. The thing I would change, however, is the rear. Uh, it's such a little house. Let's just, let's just bring brick around to the, to the rear as well and be done with it. Uh, it's a lot line condition. Uh, there is a, um, perhaps not a very large uh, um, um, donut there, but there is a donut. And I think uh, it's kind of mean spirited to present what they've designed back there. And I would just make it in brick. Otherwise I'm perfectly happy. And I think this finally does uh, feel appropriate on this block and in this uh, historic district. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Commissioner Luffy. Uh, I agree. I think this project has come a long way, and um, I think it, it just like a few little tweaks. I, I think at the base of the building, it would be great if that uh, sandstone, quartzite sandstone, was toned. And I also agree with the uh, with Fred about bringing the brick arounds on the back. Okay, great, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, am I, oh, okay. Uh, proportions in relationship to the neighbors is good and scale is, is appropriate. Uh, simple building, facade, base, middle, and corner stop. Material in their facade should be more substantial than stucco. Uh, and, and the, the area is too large to be stucco, it's just a brick. Uh, is preferred or be studied, and and in this particular case, I was looking at the at the uh, where they where they're putting in the handrail on the roof, and that should be restudied too because um, it, the 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 space between the corners and the parapet wall. That you take a look at that; it could become even richer and better if you uh, give that some more thought. But I think it's appropriate, and I think it works. 
All right, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is um, uh, significantly better than the um, last proposal. I think the, um, you know, the, un the previous facade was um, unnecessarily um, complex and uh, this simplifies it dramatically. Um, you know, the building um, is appropriate, I think, because it fits within, um, you know, the heights and massing of the buildings around it. Um, uh, so I, 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 I would also agree, however, that um, they should work with staff on the uh, materials for the rear facade, as well as that uh, uh, the issue that Commissioner Jefferson raised about the uh, the rail on the on the, on the roof. Great, thank you, Commissioner Barron. Yes, I agree with all the points that others have made about the fact that it's um, the building itself, the design is appropriate and the materials can change both uh, on the back in terms of the replacing out the cementitious and um, otherwise the honed finish. And I suppose the rail makes sense as well. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith. Yes, I agree with uh, previous commissioner's comments. Um, and I was gonna bring up the same, same comment that Commissioner Jefferson brought up about the, the railing on the roof. I think if they raise the brick parapet to the height of the, of the cornice, that'd be more uh, in keeping with a typical uh, sort of brick townhouse construction rather than seeing the, the drop parapet and the railing up there. Um, and I agree that the, the brick should wrap at the back yeah. and they can work with staff on the finishes of the, you know, the brick and the, and the, the quartzite, but okay. much improved. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, I agree with uh, the comments of other commissioners. And in general, this is, uh, has now uh, been uh, changed to the point that it is, uh, I think, uh, generally approvable and much more appropriate. Uh, I particularly agree with Commissioner Holford Smith's uh, remark about the uh, parapet and extending the parapet, around, which would be more appropriate but they can work with the staff on a variety of details that we've all uh, brought up, including those on the uh, facade of the brickwork and the stone and the, um, uh, the back, uh, as far as the material on the back, I agree that it should be brick. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Sorry. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, I agree with my fellow commissioners uh, comments about the rear facade and about the, uh, the parapet rather than the railing. Um, I'm, I'm mildly concerned about the stone at the lower portion of the front facade. The, the sandstone and quartzite, quartzite's a, a more fully metaphorized sandstone and the the problem with it is that honing may actually make it uh, more reflective and so I would say that and and there's a lot of figure in this quartzite that you don't find in sandstone I, I would say that we need to have the applicant work with staff to test a couple of different methods of abrading the, the surface of this. Because if you if you hone it, the larger quartzite crystals are going to actually polish a little bit. So they may have to abrasive blast it rather than hone it. But um, it should not be reflective. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree with the uh, comments. I think the rear facade, the bridge should be uh, should be uh, wrapped around. And also, Ann Holford Smith's uh, comment about uh, bringing up the brick to the corners is an excellent suggestion. Uh, and I agree with the rest of the comments about uh, working with the staff on the uh, continuing the uh, facade uh, material. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I think um, we've had a really good discussion and um, we, we, are, we have a consensus <laughs> to recommend approval with three very specific modifications. So I will go ahead and make this motion um, in the matter of docket number 1941516, 56 Middaw Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, a federal style house with Greek revival style details built in 1829. This is an application to construct a new building on a portion of a lot. 
Um, and I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the proposal will return a building to this now vacant lot, thereby eliminating a gap in the streetscape, that the front facade will align with the front facades of the majority of other buildings on the block, reinforcing the street wall, that the height and simple massing is in keeping with the range of heights and massings, massing of buildings found on this varied block, that the footprint of the building will not project deeper into the block than adjacent buildings, that the use of brick and, and cast stone will harmonize with the materials of other buildings in the streetscape, that the um, materials at the base and the large window opening will be consistent with the treatment of uh, bases of buildings throughout the streetscape and historic district, which often feature contrasting materials and fenestration patterns that punched masonry openings, multi-light windows, and projecting lintels at the upper floors will help support a residential scale and texture. And the planter at the sidewalk will be in keeping with the variety of areaway treatments on this block and will add greenery to the streetscape. That the brick-clad uh, side and rear facades will be consistent with other side and lot line facades found throughout the district and that the rear facade will be simply designed and feature a high solid to void ratio, um, making it consistent with the context. Um, however, I recommend that the um, applicants work with the staff to modify the design to wrap the brick around to the rear facade and to do the rear facade in brick, to um, restudy the railing and um, study raising the parapet on the side walls to the cornice height or just below the cornice height in lieu of a railing and that the applicants work with the staff to test a few different methods of treating the finish on the quartzite at the base of the building. Um, and with that, Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Yes, second. Thank you. And um, Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shimmy Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, so that's approved with those modifications. Please continue to work closely with the staff on the materials and the details at the railing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all for your comments. Uh, they're very helpful. We also wanted to, uh, sp uh, to thank uh, Amy Wooden and Emma uh, Water uh, Waterloo for working uh, very closely with us on this and for their support during the whole process. So we really yeah. appreciate uh, you know all the comments. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, and good luck with it. And please continue to work with the staff. Um, and and while we're on the subject of the staff, I do want to. It's another third unfortunate announcement I have to make today. Amy Wooden, who started in 2017 and has been here for nearly four years, is so leaving the LPC to pursue other interests. And during her time here, she's issued over 1,500 permits and she's worked on the Chrysler building and the Daily News building. Um, she was also on our telecom team, which we don't actually see a lot at public hearing, but we um, worked very closely with the uh, uh, different uh, cell phone and telecom carriers to provide um, opportunities for antennas and um, it's, an, it's an important aspect of our work that happens at the staff level. Um, she's guided dozens of applications through the hearing process and um, uh, you know a notable project that she worked on that we will all remember is the Coney Island Theater building restoration and adaptive reuse um, as well as you know many other buildings. Um, so she's been a great contributor to our preservation department, our discussions, our team, and we're going to miss Amy a lot. So thank you, Amy, for all of your hard work and dedication. Good luck. All right. Thank you. And we're going to see Amy for the next <laughs> item as well. <laughs> thank you. After all that. Bye. <laughs> That's right. She's not done quite yet. So we will be uh, yeah. on the next item, which is public meeting item number two. 
LPC 20-01343, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 196, lot 19. 216 Dean Street in the Borum Hill Historic District. This is an Italianate style row house built in 1852 to 1853, and the application is to install a solar array canopy, bulkhead, and planters on the roof and to replace windows. This was last presented at the public hearing of January 19th, 2021, and no action was taken at, at that time. And Amy will be giving the presentation today. Okay, uh, good morning, commissioners. Amy Wooden, preservation staff. And let's see. Okay, so the application before you today is to install a solar canopy, a stair bulkhead, railings, and planters at the roof, and to change a window configuration at the rear. I'm going to just advance to this front elevation. Um, so the work is taking place at 216 Dean Street, which is located on the south side of Dean Street between Bond and Nevins in the Boehm Hill Historic District. The proposal was previously shown on January 19th uh, of this year. At that time, the commission expressed support for the windows at the rear facade, which I will skip ahead to the rear view. Uh, so the change in configuration that had previously uh, multi-light historically, and they're asking for one over one. Um, the commission was in support of that, uh, but expressed concerns about the overall height and design of the solar canopy. In response, the applicant has lowered the overall height so that it is nine feet clear of the roof deck, which is the minimum height required, and simplified and regular, regularized the framing of the canopy. The bulkhead and canopy installation have also been shifted north on the roof to further minimize the visibility over the rear facade while remaining not visible over the Dean Street facade as originally proposed. And the final photos show uh, the mock-up. So here is a sight line and this is just a general sort of plot point of the mock-up photos. And here we see that it's not visible over Dean Street and I think it's, oh, and then, sorry. We'll get there. And so here is the one uh, vantage point where it is visible uh, over a sort of break from Bond Street. Um, so this is a sort of um, uh, accurate view of what you would see on the left walking down the street and then a zoomed in view to show uh, the mock-up. And the applicant is here to answer any questions about the work. Okay. Thank you, Amy. All right, do we have any questions? So just to sum up the, previously the, the canopy had a pretty robust structure and it was on an angle <clears throat> and, um, and the applicants in response to our comments about it, um, have simplified it, lowered it, and lightened it up. Okay. Um, Rich, did we receive any written comments on this uh, revised proposal? No new letters, no. Okay. That's what I thought. okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. We'll, I think, then move to our discussion. And, um, you know, as I said, the last time we looked at all aspects of this application and the one area that we focused on was the solar panel canopy. And um, that was because it was visible through the gap in the street wall around the corner. And so I think if you wanna go back to that photo, Amy, we can just look at it. It's a um, very limited view uh, for a, a, a moment on the block before it moves out of view again. And it's from a great distance. So the, the zoom view is shown just for clarity, but the photo on the left is how you actually perceive it. And you see it in the context of other rooftop decks and railings. Um, and I think last time the heavier fr the framing and the angle attracted your, everything the commissioners felt it attracted your eyes too much. And so simplifying it and flattening it and lightening it, I think has, um, really ad written responsive to the comments that we had at that time. Um, so let's go around and have a discussion. Commissioner Lutzi, would you like to start this one? Uh, 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, this project's in a much better place. The canopy is much more simplified. It looks, looks better and it's barely visible um, at a distance, so I can approve this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Uh, I can approve this. Uh, proposed work on the roof is not visible at the facade and only minimally visible from Bond Street. Proposed changes on, roof facade, on the rear facade is minimal. I can approve this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, um, I, I, can, I can find this appropriate. I think they quieted down the, uh, their approach uh, dramatically here and it is only visible from a distance. I do think that we're going to um, see more of these situations where an applicant wants to get um, usable rooftop space at the same time that they um, want to add solar. And so there's going to, this kind of thing is going to start coming up more and more. And I think we're going to have to try to develop a, um, um, some sort of uh, approach that, um, that is consistent um, for, uh, for the variety of uh, situations we're going to face. But however, this one I do find to be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, it's much simpler and I think it's appropriate. Okay. Commissioner Halford Smith. I agree, much simpler, minimally visible. I think it's appropriate. Commissioner Chapin. Yes, I agree that it's appropriate. Uh, you know, we obviously want to support these uh, conservation efforts in terms of uh, the solar panels. And they, um, I think we're gonna be presented with many, many different kinds of situations. Uh, and they've, uh, I think, improved this considerably. You know, at some point in time, perhaps there'll be other alternatives, but I think uh, each case is going to be something we're gonna to have to consider individually. But I can approve this one. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. I agree. There are gonna be more and more of these things. As I walk around my neighborhood, I'm starting to, to see placement of these things that make me cringe. They're hovering mm -hmm. over the front facades of buildings. I think this is an example that we can use to show people an appropriate approach to this uh, upgrading. Um, I can approve it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree with the comments. Uh, this is appropriate and uh, improved over last time. And Commissioner Bland. Uh, Commissioner Devonshire just took exactly the words out of my mouth. I think uh, when Sorry. these things, <laughs> no, you spoke for <laughs> I'm in agreement. Uh, I think when these things look like solar collectors only, they are at odds with the, uh, the historic character of what's below them uh, visually. Um, of course, we like to support the idea of them. Uh, but when they settle down and become horizontal and not sloped uh, and as low as possible, uh, they look more like uh, rooftop additions and so forth. And then a little more comfortable, I think, with the building, the historic building below them. So I think this uh, can become a model for others who want to be doing it. Um, so I'm, a, I'm in favor of this. And I was violently opposed to the original, um, the original idea. So it's, it's, come, it's come appropriately now to approvable. <clears throat> all right, great, thank you. All right, great. So I think we're all in agreement. And Commissioner Lefty, would you make the motion? Sure. Um, in the matter of docket LPC 20 01343, 216 Dean Street, Forum Hill Historic District, an Italian age style row house built in 1852 1853. The application is to install a solar array canopy, bulkhead, and hydros on the roof and two replace windows. I know that the style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Gorham Hill Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the work at the roof will not eliminate or conceal any significant architectural features of the building, that the rooftop installations will not be visible over the Dean Street facade, that the elevated solar canopy bulkhead and planters will only be visible over the rear facade at a distance from a limited vantage point through a break in the street wall and will be seen in the context of other rooftop accretions that the elevated solar canopy is simply designed to reminisce in a typical rooftop pergola installations 
in terms of proportion, placement, and finish, that the change in configuration of the windows at the rear facade from multi-light to simulated one over one double hung will be barely perceptible from a public thoroughfare and will be a typical configuration bound at secondary facades in this row, and that the work will not diminish the special historic or architectural character of the building or of the Clinton Hill Historic District. All right, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to our public hearing agenda. Yes, so for the public hearing items, the first is item number one, LPC 21-06569, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1943, lot 44, 101 Green Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District. This is a transitional Italianate and Neo-Grec style row house designed by Joseph Kirby and built in 1878 and later altered in 1934. The application is to construct a stoop and alter a door. And commissioners, the uh, applicant has joined the hearing. You now have control of the presentation. Uh, just remember to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Um, thank you for the last, for the, before I get into this, the, the last one on 216 was also mine. So I wanted to thank you for the guidance on that one. I think that really took um, a much better approach to the design in the end for the pergola. And I really appreciate the emphasis you put on that. Um, so anyway, back into this. Um, so we are, again, looking at the corner uh, um, of the Green Ave and Vanderbilt. And the um, this unit is part of four, uh, a row of four houses that were all built at the same time. Um, and were at, um, at some point, all four went into a, you know, a renovation that combined some of the units and withdrew this or removed the stoops from uh, all four. We are seeking to restore the stoop on this one end unit. Um, so one of the things that we really wanted to kind of discuss was the idea of this um, as an exception um, integrated into this group of four, um, exceptional as it is an end unit, um, as <clears throat> Restoring the stoop for one of the kind of intermediate units uh, would cause more of a disruption within the within the row houses, and we feel putting it on the end kind of works with the kind of traditional feel of capping the end of a, of a series. Uh, so I'm gonna, before I get into the history of it, we'll look a little bit at the, um, the existing conditions. Um, let's see, and I'm not. There we go. So, sorry, the screen's catching up a little bit. So the existing conditions that right now, uh, this is the 1980s designation of the end unit, the uh, 1940s tax photos of the all four together. So this renovation happened um, in the 30s. I'll go back to the exact date later. Um, but you can see this one has always been treated a little differently with the kind of the end units, got the cornice that wraps, the pediment, the Oriel. Um, when the renovation happened, it was uh, at the ownership of the Diocese of New York. And so they added a little pediment there with a cross and it will get to that. Um, this is the picture of the four. Our, our building is right here. The other entrances, so you can see our entrance here, um, the other ones, 103, 105, 107, other pictures of our entryway. Uh, so you can see here, it's going to, it a race, recessed where the stoop would have been, the cross and the pediment, um, a triangular pediment as opposed to the square uh, lintels. So it's always been thought of as 
slightly different than the others. And here are a couple of other examples of uh, similar stoops or similar buildings. Um, in our case on the left, uh, architect was Joe Kirby, built in 1878. Another one he did within the same district uh, in 1876, almost identical styles uh, in terms of the articulation of the windows, um, the kind of the, the, the pediment, the enframement, uh, the articulation of the stairs, the arches around the lower window, the banding at the base, this is practically identical. Um, and then another builder about the same time, Benjamin Lincoln, did this 29 Clifton Place, again, you know, within the same district and also extremely similar in its detailing. So here's the existing and proposed uh, front elevations. No changes to the rest of it, obviously, except for this window and the door. And those are the details that we reviewed with staff. Um, the kind of an overall elevation of the two, of the, the proposed and existing for all four houses. So again, you can kind of see how the end unit has been treated a little bit differently and kind of caps off this row at the corner. So, one of the things that we wanted to talk about in terms of this was this idea that this is a separate building. And I'm going to try to zoom in on this timeline here. Um, and we've talked about, so all four of these buildings were designed and built in 1878. Up until 1834, they were all, they had all been purchased and were occupied and owned separately. In 31, the Catholic Diocese purchased and combined 101 and 103. In 34, all four were renovated uh, to remove the stoops. From that point until 1976, they were owned to get collectively by the diocese. They were purchased thereafter by John Melvin and then sold and purchased by CHS, at which point in the early 80s, CHS renovated all four as separate buildings obtained C of O's for each one separately. So comparing these periods of ownership, we could see they were owned all separately for 56 years, collectively for 51, and then currently up in 36. So it's really only about a third of the time that they were owned collectively. And I think this was kind of an important distinction to make as we consider how um, we deal with this in the context of the other four buildings. Um, so I think that pretty much covers the points that we wanted to make. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Just, just a lesson in history. Why were the stoops removed uh, in, at all? Do you know? We only, as far as I know, we only know that they were removed by the diocese when the buildings were combined and okay. all owned by the diocese. There was not, as I, uh, in speaking with staff and in the research that we did do, we could not find anything specific stating why they were removed. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, it sort of was common in the, first half of the 20th century uh, for row houses to be converted to multiple dwellings. In this case, you know, a, a building used by the diocese combined with three others, but many times they were converted from multiple dwellings and stoops were removed. So it is, there is sort of a pattern of that happening generally to row houses in the early 20th century. Um, but in this case, I think it was, you know, for the use that the, the diocese had uh, for these four buildings. Okay, other questions? Yes, Commissioner Bland. Just uh, unmute, accept uh, my request to unmute yourself. Sorry, fell for that. That's right. okay. Um, for those of us who live in um, houses with stoops, we know why they were removed. <laughs> Ice and snow does not make it happy to have a stoop. All other aspects of stoops are wonderful, but that is 
that killed them for a lot of people back in the uh, early part of the 20th century. I'll just add that little <laughs> caveat. All right, other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. So we'll take public testimony and we may have more questions or thoughts after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Lisa Krasavich to walk us through the testimony. Lisa? Lisa, you're muted. I can't hear you, Lisa. I apologize, I was double muted there. Um, <laughs> so we had two people sign up and I've already brought Kelly Carroll in. There you go. Thank you, Lisa. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. Like thousands of row houses during the Great Depression, 101 Green Avenue lost its stoop in 1934 when it was sensitively tenantized along with its neighbors. And to um, what was just talked about, a lot of these houses were broken up during the depression and, to, and instead of keeping up these big expensive houses, they were turned into uh, apartments for rental income. Uh, so a lot of this happened during the depression. This is very common. Returning a stoop to a row house reestablishes the formal entry and circulation of the home. And HDC suggests that the proposed stoop requires a formal railing treatment as well. In the drawings packet, the applicant cites 71 Gates Avenue, which was built two years earlier in 1876 by the same architect, Thomas Kirby. Kirby's railing treatment at 71 Gates was decidedly robust and made of cast pieces, which was typical of the era. HDC finds the proposed railing to be insubstantial and a different system should be explored that is more in keeping with the spirit of the era in the house. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have John Graham. Good morning, commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society, uh, Victorian Society in New York. Founded in New York City in 18, 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual <laughs> landmarks, interiors, and civic art. The Victorian Society in New York can enthusiastically support almost every aspect of this excellent proposal. In an historic district where so many stoops have been stripped away, it's sometimes almost impossible to remember the dignity and presence these formal entrances once gave to these streets. The stoop restoration these applicants are proposed, proposing based on the design proportions, materials, and most of the details of historic stoops will add immeasurably to this building and may we hope serve to inspire the owners of the three houses uh, in this row. And while we recognize that the construction will require the removal of the existing areaway entrance and the window and window surround directly above, which all predate the 1940 tax photos, we note that the work will not eliminate any original historic material dating back to 1878. However, we find the proposed stoop railings to be overly simple and urge the applicant to base the design of the new stoop railings on the railings shown in the excellent photograph of 71 Gates Avenue on board five, an 1876 row house designed by the same architect, Joseph Kirby, who designed 101 Green. Thank you very much, commissioners. Okay, thank you. And that concludes the testimony. Thank you. And Rich, did we receive any additional written testimony? Yes, we did receive uh, a letter from Brooklyn Community Board 2 in the recommended approval. And we also received a letter from the Citizens for Responsible Neighborhood Planning of Clinton Hill and Fort Greene in support of the application. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hill, would you like to respond to the comments that we've heard? In particular, I think the railing has been an issue. Right. Right. The railing has been definitely a point of concern when, when looking at this. Um, our approach in this is to consider this as an end unit of the four buildings. 
And as such, we felt that the railing uh, that stretches in the front is consistent all the way from all four units and around the side of the building. Uh, we felt that that would be more appropriate to keep that railing consistent throughout all four units um, and going up the stoop. Uh, we recognize that it's not 100% in keeping with the original style, but felt that in this portion of the design, it made more sense for it to be consistent with the others. Um, there is definitely a relationship of the four buildings, and this one is kind of the end cap to the four, but it still is part of those four buildings, and we felt that changing the style to obviously a much different uh, style and appearance um, would separate out the building too much from its context. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any uh, final questions? Okay, so I'm going to start to request to unmute all of you so we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. And uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I so second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll begin our discussion now. And um, this is for a, a very discreet change, replacing the um, ground floor entry, uh, removing the ground floor entry uh, to uh, allow for the restoration of a stoop and recreating a parlor floor entry um, and details on the facade around the door and a new railing and a new gate under the stoop. Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this discussion? I would, and uh, I think, unfortunately, I disagree with the applicant's um, ideas about the railings. I, I tend to agree with the testimony. Uh, <coughs> the proposed railing is not one that ever existed on this building, and the fact that there may have been uh, mistakes made on the other buildings of the row uh, doesn't mean that that mistake should be remade on this one. We have a perfect opportunity to replicate what was there originally. Uh, there is evidence of it. And I think uh, the railing notwithstanding, um, I can approve everything, but I would like to see a different railing. Okay, thank you. And, it, you know, I think um, the um, commission has often approved new railings that are consistent with the age and style, if not a replication. So for you, would that be also an, you know, an op, um, maybe a direction for them to work with the staff on something consistent with the age and style? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I agree. Commissioner Bland? Um, I certainly agree too, but let me just ex say something. I. I saw these very handsome, very handsome buildings, all of whom had their stoops removed at one time. And I thought, well, m maybe it's inappropriate to put it back here. And then I found myself intellectually describing why we wouldn't put a stoop back. And I found myself at odds with that philosophical point of view. So that's uh, where I am, that that's a bad, a bad place to be. Can't, can't add a stoop back. Absolutely, you can, and this is a good example of how this is an in condition of which the applicant pointed out and ha has always been treated slightly differently. So uh, partly because of that, but partly because we're restoring a stoop in principle, um, I'm fully supportive. And I like the idea of working with the staff to get the railing right. <clears throat> Okay, great. And, um, and I think, you know, you were right to think about that. That is the very reason that this application is before us is the question of whether that change um, was a significant change in the in the 1930s. And, um, and while it did provide a pediment, I think that so many of the original details still remain on the facade and, and that if returning a stoop would enhance the original style. But in some cases, buildings were completely redesigned when their stoops were removed. And in those cases, we might not find it appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I think it's incredible that this building is coming full circle from where it was. And I, uh, 
I have to applaud the applicant in that regard. And I, I think this is a hopefully going to, if the other buildings are interested, it, it could be an inspiration to what happens to the other three buildings. And, and uh, having the fence be one that is more compatible with what was there at that time, I think will we'll also uh, you know, reinforce that. So I agree okay. with the yeah. fellow commissioners. Great. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I, I agree with uh, all the comments. There's only, if you go to the facade, the, um, the existing facade and the new facade, and here's a question for me in terms of replication. I mean, I agree that the stoop works. It's a good idea to, be, to uh, add the stoop. But I question about the design in terms of replication. I mean, the existing one is simpler and, 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 and there's a cloth. And you know, that's, that's historic fabric that's been there. And, and I know we are against all that religious stuff, but it's, 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 it's replication of that. Um, is replication better than interpretation in this case? That's a question I've been asking myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think we've approved both. So we found both approaches to be appropriate. Um, in different instances. Okay. Um, Commissioner Shim, uh, Gustafson, sorry. Uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, my fellow commissioners. Um, it is appropriate. Um, I did not, um, unlike others, um, I didn't really have to struggle with this in the slightest bit. You had me at stoop. <laughs> Okay, great. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, um, I of course can approve this and think it's appropriate, but I agree with Commissioner Bland. There's a, you know, there's a, a bit of a hesitation at first because these are just all of them so, so beautiful, so handsome, that is the right word. And the, um, the kind of the proportions of the windows, the size of the windows is so impressive. Uh, but this particular one bumps up uh, that that window in the middle. So it kind of gives us a little bit of room, I think, to do something with it, uh, unlike the others on the row. But um, I think it's appropriate. And I do agree, though, with um, Commissioner Devonshire about the rail, and I think that that can be um, worked through with staff. Great, thanks. Okay, Commissioner Holford smith I think putting the stoop back here is appropriate. Um, I I understand the, the, the sort of the, the debate, um, but I think trying to bring it back to its original um, is a, as an appropriate thing to do. And I think if you're going to do that, then you should also bring back the railing to the original um, rather than doing it half interpretation and half replication. But I think they could work with staff on that. All right. And Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, uh, I absolutely in this case agree that this it's appropriate to bring back the stoop. I think that uh, it, it's not a case as you as uh, mentioned that there's been a a whole stylistic change to the building. In which case, it might be totally a totally different issue. I think we it, this is going to bring it back very close to its uh, historic situation. And I think that the railing, an, an ornate railing that's appropriate to the time and architect working with the staff is, is uh, what should be done in this case as well, because it's not going to look the same as the other buildings exactly. That's the point. You're, you're showing that this is what it, it, this is closer to what it looked like originally. And uh, it's gonna help separate the building and illustrate that these were separate buildings rather than uh, looking like uh, part of, uh, you know, part of a complex of uh, four buildings combined, which I think we often uh, stress uh, that it's extremely important to try to show that historical uh, division in uh, changes that are made to buildings. So I'm totally in favor of this one uh, with the addition of some kind of more ornate rain on.
excuse me, um, we're all in agreement. So Commissioner Devonshire, would you make this motion to approve with modifications that they continue to um, work with the staff to uh, restudy the railing to to redesign the railing to be more consistent with the agent style of the building? Sure. In the matter of 101 Green Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District, um, a transitional Italian at neo Greek row house designed by Joseph Kirby and built in seven, 1878, altered in 1934, an application to construct a stoop and alter the door. I recommend approval with some modification, finding that the removal of the stoop did not represent a significant later alteration as the facade retains all of its neo Greek details, including fenestration, window surrounds and cornice, and therefore the recreation of a stoop will restore the building closer to its original condition. That the design and details of the proposed stoop and parlor floor entrance will recall the other neo Greek and Italian age style stoop. <coughs> Stucco cladding will closely match the historic brownstone in terms of finish, texture, profiles, and details. That the proposed paired wood and glass parlor floor doors are in keeping with doors of buildings of this age and style in terms of proportions, materials, details, and finish. That the proposed arch metal gate and the basement entrance below the stoop featuring a metal grill will recall the historic gates below the stoops in terms of design and details. And the work will enhance the special architectural and historic character of the building streetscape in the Clinton Hill Historic District and the applicant will work with landmark staff to to recreate an appropriate set of stoop railings. Thank you and Commissioner Chen would you second that motion? Delighted to second. Thank you. Rich will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. So that's approved, and please continue to work with the staff on the ironwork design. Okay, thank we'll move to the next item. Thank you. The next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 19-40719, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1665, lot 32, 522 Halsey Street in the Bedford Stuyvesant Expanded Stuyvesant Heights Historic District. This is an Italianate style row house designed by Isaac D. Reynolds and built in 1882. The application is to legalize the replacement of the areaway fence and stoop ironwork and alterations to the facade without LPC permits. And uh, the commissioners will note that the applicant has joined the hearing and uh, staff will be uh, walking through the presentation uh, with um, the applicant available for questions and to make a comment at the end. Staff, you may begin. So Katie, we could just... Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, commissioners, Katie, or good afternoon, commissioners, Katie Rice, LPC staff. 522 Halsey Street is located between Lewis Avenue and Stuyvesant Avenue in the expanded Bedford Stuyvesant Historic District. The proposal is to uh, legalized facade alterations in the replacement of the stoop and areaway ironwork. Um, this is 522 Halsey Street as it currently looks. This is its location. This is this, the building in the street context is all the way to the left in the streetscape. So historically, um, the building is on the left and this is what the building looked like at the time of designation. So some of the changes we're looking at here um, include at the, the front, uh, the areaway ironwork was removed and replaced with um, new areaway ironwork. The stoop was resurfaced and new stoop ironwork was added. In addition, um, 
facade, facade alterations were made. The building was painted. Um, lintels were added, uh, a door surround, um, door uh, glass was replaced with etched glass, a transom window added, and I believe that's it. So here are some of the precedents for, for the window lintels. The door surround and some of the stoop ironwork. Um, the owner is here to speak. Should I speak now? Yes, please go ahead oh, okay. and just state your name. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you. <laughs> it's Rebecca Wolf. Um, I'm, I know you have the package and in the package it includes the-, the... Rebecca, are you here to speak? I'm sorry? You can't hear me? I can, we can hear you, please go oh, ahead. We can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry, Katie said something. I don't know what she said. Um, I know in the package, you have uh, the letters that in, that prove that we did not know the house was uh, landmarked. Otherwise we would have gotten the permits, uh, you know, so that we wouldn't have had to deal with this seven years, eight years later. Um, it, I don't know what else. I mean, that's the same door. We just stripped it. Uh, if you have, you, why don't you ask me questions and I'll answer anything you have. Uh, oh, and the, the fencing, there was no gate and that original fence did not continue on that corner. It was some, you know, it matched like the, uh, the, the railing that was uh, there when we bought the house. And now we're living through some construction next door. <laughs> So uh, you can't even see the facade right now because we're scaffolded. So um, any, if, any questions you have, I'm ready and willing to answer. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions um, either on the scope of the work or the details of that work? Oh, I'm sorry, I have one thing to say. I forgot. Yes. <laughs> uh, the title company didn't find out that the house was in a historic district because it wasn't designated until this March 26, 2021 on our ACRIS. So there was no L, there was nothing to even give us that safety net to find out through that means that the house, you know, was landmarked. Okay. When did you purchase the house? Uh, uh, we closed June 25th, 2013 and the According to the letter that the developer got, which I was sent by Landmarks, I think two years ago or a year ago, uh, the developer was told in April, 2013, that it was landmarked and never divulged that to us. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Commissioners, any questions on any of the details here? Sort of a lot of parts to it. Okay. All right. Why don't we go to public testimony and that may give us a chance to think if, whether or not we have more questions. Okay. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa Chris Average to take us through the testimony. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we'll start with um, Evelyn Collier. Um, we brought you in. Okay, did I mute? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. you did. Okay, good afternoon. Hi, um, my name is Evelyn Collier, uh, representing Community Board 3. Um, in response to application LPC 1940719, um, the alterations, um, the applicants seeking to legalize the replacement airway fence stoop with uh, railings and facade work uh, and requesting a legalization of the work that they've done without LPC permit. Uh, after careful review and evaluation, the committee respects the owner's efforts to make improvements to the property and believe that five of the violations should be dismissed, 19 19.0375, 19.0376, 
and 1903-79, and we failed to be legalized for LPC. However, the committee did find the facade work violation 1904 is incompatible with the district form and character and should not be legalized by LPC. The commission should provide guidance to the applicant as to the allowable paint or brick treatment doorway surround details and the cornice bracket. Therefore, the Brooklyn Community Board 3 resolved to, uh, we supported the dismissal of the legalization of five violation, which I've stated before. And because the changes do not significantly impact the district form and character and are compatible with the nearby row houses, the board further resolves to support the enforcement violation 190374 because it is incompatible with the district form and character. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have uh, John Graham. Good afternoon, commissioners. Commissioners, the VSNY finds that the work at 522 Halsey, which the applicants are proposing to legalize, can be broken down into two categories, the changes to the ironwork, which we support, and the addition of decorative elements to the facade, which we do not. The applicants have provided us with copies of the tax photo, the photos taken at designation, and photos of the existing conditions. The tax photo shows historic ironwork in place at the areaway fence and gate, the basement windows, and at the stoop. By designation, most of this was gone or replaced with very simple modern ironwork. Only the section of the areaway fence directly in front of the basement windows remain. While the VSNY does not usually support removing sound historic ironwork, we believe that because the areaway fence, sorry, the areaway gate and the section of fence to the left of the gate had been lost prior to designation, the removal of the remaining sections of areaway fencing is acceptable in this instance. In addition, because the new black painted ironwork fence and gate, the basement window grills and the stoop railings are based on historic ironwork found on buildings of this age and type, <clears throat> the installation of this well-detailed material has unified the building and has brought it back significantly closer to its historic appearance and relationship to the street. However, the tax photos also clearly show the simplicity of the historic facade and that its designation, except for the loss of the arch-headed doors and five of the nine brackets at the cornice, the facade was substantially unchanged. The applicant has provided photographs of more elaborately detailed houses in this neighborhood, but almost every historic district has buildings with very simple facades, as well as those with very elaborate facades. Changing the former to imitate the latter only diminishes the character of the altered building, the street, and the district. The VSNY therefore recommends denial of the legalization of the changes to the facade and urges the removal of the modern additions to the door and window surrounds and the cornice. Restoring properly detailed brackets to the cornice to match the historic condition is encouraged. Finally, commissioners, in her presentation, Katie didn't mention the addition of the decorative elements to the cornice. Please review the cornice additions on slide seven. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. There we go. The committee understands that the alterations that occurred on this house were carried out without knowledge of landmark status and that's, that this was not an intentional act. HDC found the installed ironwork and fencing appropriate. The facade work is not appropriate. The reason that the facade alterations are unsuccessful is because they were applied incorrectly, both stylistically and proportionally onto this Italianate style home. For example, the Neograc window and door lintels are several inches too broad atop each of their respective openings. The introduction of faces within the lintels is vaguely referential of ornament from a Queen Anne Romanesque transitional style building, except in the reference style, faces are typically accompanied with soft flourishes, not the angularity of lintels. On streets like these in Bedford-Stuyvesant, there's little room for individuality because the architectural beauty relies on the homogeneity of the collective row. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And so we have one more. Christabel had her hand up and down. Okay, I don't see any hands up. I think that concludes the testimony. Okay, thank you. And Rich, did we receive any? Oh, I see a hand going <laughs> I, up. <laughs> let's, let's bring Christabel in. It's going up and down. Okay. Okay, Christabel, you've joined the meeting. Hello. Did you want to testify? Yes, I did. C can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. So sorry about that with the hand. Uh, Christabel Goff is speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. It is unclear whether the mask now suspended above the front doorway represents Jupiter, Vulcan, or Neptune. Three bearded deities from the ancient world. In any case, contrary to the objections posted by other preservationists, in fact, the Jupiter mask is not integrated into the structure of the door frame. It, that fact is not a detriment, but in fact, the very quality that might make a finding of appropriateness possible. So far as we know, there is no claim that the mask was always or ever there, or that it was dictated by any earlier style of local decoration. Rather, it is an applied ornament of classical design, but contemporary origin. Judging from the designation report, it does not disrupt the unity of any extant row, since 522 today is a lone house from 1882, standing between a 20th century garage, which is now apparently part of a confusingly documented stable complex, and I now hear is undergoing alteration, and a row of later houses dating from 1890. While there may be minor proportional issues with the woodwork reconstruction, we would urge that the commission should not forbid ownership to retain this unusual application of a group of classical masks, which are harmful only in the eyes of the most pedantic interpreters of the stylistic requirements of the law, and could be an interesting new feature of an already inconsistent streetscape. Okay, thank you very much. And that concludes the testimony. Okay, great. And Rich, did we receive any additional written testimony? No other additional written comments. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Wolf, would you like to respond to the comments? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we're not architects or anything. We just walked around when we bought the house and looked at things that we thought were beautiful and, and added them. And the, the, the door itself was beautiful, as I said, so we just had it stripped. And there was just a plain piece of glass in there that you could see right into the house. So we put in what we thought was a leaded, you know, leaded glass. Um, and then we put the, the woodwork around the door um, that we saw around the neighborhood uh, because they had really had just put what looked like railroad ties around the doorway. Um, the house, we came to find out when we went to LPC the first time when we, we didn't even get the violations in the mail, they were sent to the wrong address. So when I finally got them, I went to LPC and that's when I was told that the house, as Ms. Goff just said, was a standalone house, an Italianette, which I then looked up, which is a little more uh, ornamental than the houses that came after this house. And the 20th century garage uh, was recently destroyed. So um, that what's going to go up next to us is, a, a you know, a a townhouse, uh, townhouses, and then some garages. Uh, so I don't know, we, we think the house is beautiful, <laughs> but we're gonna do whatever you guys say because we just hope it doesn't cost us a lot of money. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Commission, any final questions, commissioners? 
All right, I'm starting to request to unmute all of you so we can move to our discussion. All right, and uh, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Lefsey, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed. And, um, and we'll begin our discussion. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the applicant did not, the owner did not, was not aware of the landmark status um, and um, made alterations to the building, um, I think, in the hopes and, and plan to um, improve its appearance. And, um, you know, that's sometimes tricky when that happens without the benefit of our guidance. Sometimes you can. Uh, get outside of uh, the uh, choices that might be more appropriate to the age and style of the building. So there are multiple aspects here and some of them, you know, we may have more comfort with than others as we heard in the testimony. Um, so we'll begin our discussion, but just remember, just to kind of remind you what the aspects of this are. There's the repainting of the facade. It was already painted at the time of designation, a light color. There is the um, door surround and the leaded glass in the, within the pre-existing door and the transom. Um, there are the window lintels and the ornament um, within the window lintels. There are the brackets added to the cornice, um, which are, and the cornice is painted in a two-tone color. And, um, and then there's the ironwork and paving at the area way. So um, a lot of little parts and we'll begin our discussion. And, um, and I also just wanna note that as, as Christabel Goff testified and as the owner mentioned, this um, building does sort of stand on its own and that may factor into your decision-making. Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you like to start this one? Sure, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I, I understand that the owner tried to uh, make improvements to her house um, in the best way she saw fit and unfortunately didn't come to us. And so we sort of view this through the lens of would we have approved this had we seen it um, you know, come to us first. So um, I'm gonna start with the ironwork. Um, I think it's unfortunate that the section of original ironwork was lost. Um, I understand it wasn't complete um, and that the railing on the stoop was certainly um, a later addition. So I, I can find the ironwork at this stoop and the areaway to be appropriate to the, to the spirit of the, of the age of the building. Um, and I think the resurfacing of the stoop is fine. <clears throat> um, the cornice originally had more brackets on it. So I understand the, the addition of those, the, the brackets that they've added, but I think that the two-tone paint um, calls sort of uh, a strange attention to it. And I think it should be a monotone uh, paint finish, the darker, darker color. Um, and I guess the, the biggest um, point of uh, debate is gonna be the, the window lintels and the, and the masks. And I think, um, I think just proportionately, they, they are not, they don't seem appropriate to me, the, the added lintels. Um, I think that the small scale of the building doesn't really warrant the, the sort of oversized lintels that, are, that have been installed. And that's true of the door, although I think the, the wood door surround could remain. I just think that the, the um, overhanging lintels are, are out of proportion for the rest of the building. So I think that's, that's my take. Okay, and, and the paint color on the facade? I think that's okay. I mean, I think it was, it would have been sort of a brick and stone. Um, I, I, I'm okay with the light color. Yeah, it was painted already. And yeah. It's, within this streetscape, there are other lighter painted facades. Okay. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, uh, this is a very unfortunate situation since obviously the owner was really trying to beautify their building as best they could and, and did not realize they were dealing with a, a landmark situation where they needed to consult with someone. So it's, um, and, and I think mo most of the changes uh, or many of the changes I could certainly find appropriate. 
Um, I think that uh, the, I agree with uh, Commissioner Holford Smith that the ironwork uh, is, the current ironwork is appropriate and something we could have approved. Uh, also the finish of the uh, steps and the, the door and the, uh, the, I think the door is surround as well um, for me. Uh, the cornice, as was discussed, should be monochrome, uh, but the addition of the brackets was a good thing going back to the original uh, situation. Uh, the main issue is sort of the heaviness of these lintels and the decorative uh, features. And the question is, I guess, it, it, that we could regard this as it, it is a sort of standalone building, really not so much a part of a row. And, so the question is, what would be appropriate for this Italianate style with this? And I, I don't feel, uh, I, I think there are people probably more expert on the uh, panel to speak to that. And I'm interested in what they have to say. I'm trying to figure out uh, to, to how much of this, of the heaviness of the lentils and so forth could be relatively easily removed. And I'd like to hear what others have to say about that. Um, I think it's probably desirable to um, have a lighter and less decorative uh, uh, condition for the lentils and um, the probably the, um, the uh, situation over the door. But um, I'd like to hear some others' comments on the same. And as far as color, I think that's fine. Okay. All right, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the ironwork and the work at the stoop is acceptable. Um, the, the additional um, applications in the cornice, I think can probably stay, but they need to get painted out. The, uh, the window hoods and the door hood, unfortunately, I think need to be removed. The, the um, the field color on the on the uh, facade is fine, but I think the color should actually go back to the before photograph once the changes are made, once those hoods are removed. I think the the leaded glass in the door the door uh, surround is fine. So can you just? Uh, I'm not sure what if I got the your comment about the the field color. The, um, it should I, go back to the color of, at the time I of think designation. The color is fine, but I think the trim should go back to oh, a, got a it. brown. To a okay. brown. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I'm in agreement here. I think the iron work is uh, uh, understood uh, acceptable. I think that what the uh, Commissioner Devonshire just recommended seems. Uh, uh, along with others, I, I would defer to uh, people that is more knowledgeable in this area than on this case. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Um, I have to say, I was really moved by Christabel's um, testimony. <laughs> Surprising to me uh, that she would make that testimony, uh, really um, uh, showing a kind of a fresh ap approach. Um, and I do sympathize with the owner who I think in complete good spirit uh, proceeded um, not knowing uh, that we were, that we were hovering in the, in the background. Um, so I don't need to repeat it all. I think the ironwork is fine. Um, I think what uh, Michael Devonshire has suggested is probably pretty much my thought as well. Um, I think a lot of this can stay. I mean, if this were done and you know, 1880, instead of when it was done, uh, it would have been what everybody was doing and what we would never allow to be changed now. But in fact, uh, it's different. Um, so I think we can take a kind of a looser standard here, but maybe the hood, uh, window hoods and, and, uh, and the door hood maybe is the most egregious thing that should be changed. And perhaps that corner should be painted a solid color. Um, but I'm on the, on, the, on, the, on the edge of saying, let's not be too harsh here. <clears throat> okay. Commissioner Lutfi. 
Um, I also want to sympathize with the owner and, and say it's wonderful that you love your home and you've done everything you thought you were allowed to do uh, to, uh, to make it more wonderful for you. Uh, but I do, I do agree with uh, many of the comments. I think the ironwork and the resurfacing of the stoop are fine. Um, I agree that the, the cornice is okay, but the, the paint should be uniform. Uh, I do think that the uh, door, really lintel and the surround should be removed and the same with the windows, the uh, everything applied should leave. I, I'm not feeling uh, like the, I think the surface of the building color is fine. I'm not feeling that the the color um, at the top and bottom of the windows has to be brown. It just should be muted. So. Okay. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a simple, plain facade at time of designation. I think it's, it's quite nice, simple. And uh, going to these line items, the corners should be painted one color. And, uh, and, and, and I'm ambiguous about the decoration there or not, or leaving it or just painting it out. I think the, um, the, the window head Issue. They're, they're a little heavy, and I think removing them would. Uh, I think they should. <laughs> I think I sh they should be removed. They're just too heavy for this simple facade. It's just a simple little building. You, know, you don't need to add all this to it. And like the only issue I have is basically the color, uh, uh, whether to restore the softer color um, or not. And and um, that's the staff to decide. Okay, just type on the okay. page. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. You know the uh, the pulling of permits for a job like this is is the moment of truth, and it's incredibly important that um, the folks who are responsible for putting that L there um, actually put it there, and. Um, because that, that is the thing that sort of saves us in terms of communication. Um, you know, if you can't pull a permit uh, without going through us, then you can't. Um, so in a situation like this where the system failed, um, we do have to allow for um, broader latitude. Um, and I agree in all respects with um, uh, Commissioner Devonshire's um, uh, positions on every issue. I would note that if not for the um, the failure of the of the system here, I, I would I would have been much more concerned about removing that um, incredibly beautiful original ironwork in front of the structure and may have gone and would probably not have approved that had it been um, uh, uh, had it not been the situation that we're in here. Um, however, in light of where we are, um, I am okay with it. I may have misheard, but I thought I heard that the that end portion didn't exist even at the time of designation. So no, it was a modern. My understanding was that the, the the segment that ran in front of the structure was there. Uh, I think we saw it, and 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 it it did yeah. not it, it terminated before the gate and the turn on, on and the turn around right. the corner. Yeah, so there was that's an option. Right. There was an option to match that. Um, because it didn't, it appeared to be in terrific condition and, right. and that's what I'm saying, but I, but is because of where we are, I'm okay with this. Okay, great. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I think that I agree with, uh, the testimony of, uh, Christabel Guff. I, I actually, um, firstly, I, I, it's, it is unfortunate that they, that the applicant was not aware of the landmark status and um, and I think typically we would ask the question would we approve this otherwise you know if it had come to us 
And I think for, for nearly everything, I think we might have. Um, so the, the ironwork uh, and, and, uh, and even potentially even the door, although we might have wanted it simplified. But I, I think that this issue with the, um, the window hoods is, I mean, clearly there's really an expression of, of, um, of an of attachment to to the building itself, to some to to a kind of personal research in the in the district, in the historic areas, for references for things that the owner thought were were interesting and might improve their building. Um, so I actually think that I can approve and would not want for them to undo these the the window hoods. I think the only thing that actually throws me is the light blue color. Um, of of the door surround and maybe even of the of the window um, elements themselves, not so much the cornice. So I, I might ask that the that that color be kind of toned down and either lighter or darker, one direction or another. Um, so in a sense, to kind of paint out some of those details in and and maybe on in the cornice, although I wouldn't require that. So for the most part, I think I can approve it almost as presented. And in other words, I can approve it and not see them in violation. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Um, it, thank you. This was a, a good discussion. And uh, again, I want to thank the owner for taking care of her building and um, doing the best that she could and I think really felt doing the right thing for the house. And I think um, where we are and uh, is right now is that a majority of the commissioners are comfortable with a majority of aspects of this work, um, except that the, I think that the, the consensus of those who agree that the cornice should be painted one color, the brackets and the ornament added to the cornice and that the um, lintels, not so much because of the ornamentation, but because of their scale, um, are not consistent with the age and style of the building. And the third um, element I think that we've heard among the different speakers, uh, commissioners, are um, that the color of the lintels should be restudied in consultation with staff. So lintels and sills. Um, so, I, th I think that's where the majority of the commissioners are. So Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make a motion that recommends those three modifications? And um, we'll take a vote on that. Sure. <clears throat> In the matter of LPC 19-40719, 522 Halsey Street in the Bedford Stuyvesant Expanded Stuyvesant Heights Historic District, an Italianate style row house designed by Isaac D. Reynolds and built in 1882. The application is to legalize the replacement of the areaway fence and stoop ironwork and alterations to the facade without Landmarks Preservation Commission permits. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Bedford Stuyvesant, expanded Stuyvesant Heights Historic District. I further note that this row house was built in the 1880s in the Italianate style prior to the construction of the neighboring properties and that the historic stoop ironwork and the cornice details were removed prior to designation. I recommend approvals, modifications, finding that the stoop was resurfaced with a brownstone tinted cementitious stucco with a finish in keeping with the original stoop. That the ironwork is consistent with the Italianate style of the house and is compatible with a variety of ironwork found at areaways and stoops within the historic district. That the altar the alteration to the entryway infill, including creating a transom and replacing the clear glazing with etched glass in the door did not result in the loss of historic fabric. That the installation of additional cornice brackets recalls the historic condition, which featured numerous articulated brackets. That the light gray painted finish of the facade, which was painted a different light color at the time of designation, remains harmonious with the painted facades of the adjoining buildings and that the bluestone pavers are typical of paving materials found at areaways within this historic district. However, I found that the two-tone finish of the cornice and the new brackets and the applied decorative ornamentation of the lintels and door surround are not in keeping with the simpler historic details of this Italianate style facade 
and diminutive relationship to the buildings on the block, which are, or, which are of a similar period. Uh, therefore, I recommend that the applied decorative ornaments at the projecting lintels and door surround be removed and the underlying masonry be restored and the cornice brackets be repainted in uniform color with the remainder of the cornice and that the applicant work with staff to uh, come to a conclusion of a, a satisfactory color for the trim and the, the lintels. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Can I some, can Commissioner, I Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. All right, great, thank you. So that's approved with those modifications. Please continue to work closely with the staff. All right, so commissioners, we are going to take a lunch recess now for 30 minutes. So we will um, come back at 1.15. You can just turn your camera and audio off and we'll ask all members of the public to exit the meeting at this time and to re-enter the meeting at 1.15. And we'll see you then for the afternoon session. Thank you all. Sarah, um, yes. is there a process for fixing the kind of problem we just heard?